number of emails from residents around the Eastman Road subdivision. Um, they're not part of the formal package. They are part of what is on record now that we have received. We received five or six e emails from people. So thank you very much for your, your comments. Believe me, we take them very, very seriously. Okay, old business. Um, the Moskowitz McMullen Resource Protection Permit. And we have a request that the application for a resource protection permit for 4,191 square feet of previously filled wetland and pond for landscaping located at 221 Fickett Street, section 9-8-3, um, be tabled until the next meeting. Remind the board if we have anything we want to discuss about this particularly, um, we should table, we should not vote to table it, and if we don't have anything, we should have a motion. I have a question. Yeah. Do we have any report from the Conservation Commission? Or? Um, there is a report from the Conservation Commission on this. I just didn't include it in this packet, thinking that it would be more helpful for you to have it all together at the same time at the November meeting. <clears throat> that given, do we have a motion for the board to consider, please? Barbara, motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Diane Maskowitz and Scott McMullen for an after the fact resource protection permit to fill 4,191 square feet of wetland and pond for landscaping located at 221 Fickett Street be tabled to the regular November 26, 2007 meeting at which time a public <coughs> hearing will be held. Sir. Any discussion? All in favor? Passed. Thank you. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda, Old Sea Point Road Subdivision Amendment. Bob, would you like to? We'll give this a shot the next door. Oh. Please introduce yourself, Bob. Okay. I'm Bob Metcalf with Mitchell Associates. Uh, we're landscape architects and planners in Portland. And we're here on behalf of Sally Crockett, who is the applicant and the owner of Lot 1. Um, and if I can get this presentation up in the water, I'll get there. Okay. Okay, Maureen, I may have to use your assistance only because this is a little different than mine. existing four lot subdivision that was before the board back in 2003 for an amendment which was the uh, third time the board has seen this application uh, and what we has an existing 12 foot wide roadway that serves the, the four lots the last two lots let's see if I get this to lock now. the last two lots that the board looked at was the creation of lot one and lot two and lot one is the one that Ms. Crockett has presently owns, and this is the one we're talking about this evening. Uh, the, I'll take you from the beginning as a walk through the property. Uh, this is the entrance at Old Ocean House Road. Uh, site distance, looking left, is about 800 plus feet. And then looking uh, to the south, to where the bend in the road is in here, we're looking at about 300 uh, plus or minus feet. Uh, Walking up through the site, uh, this is roughly the red dot that you see on the plan is roughly where this photograph is taken. Uh, the paved surface of the roadway is 12 feet. 
as you can see on either side, the shoulder area is vary in width. We're looking at six feet to the left, four feet to the right. As we work our way up, uh, we're just coming up the crest, and again, you see with the, the change, it gets a little bit wider on the right-hand side, and it stays about the same on the left-hand side. This is about the crest of the roadway. Uh, I'll go back to that afterwards. And this is looking back up roughly where the Sulquist driveway is. This is the Sulquist property, and we're looking back down towards Ocean House Road. And then this is the turnaround that was required as part of the uh, 2003 plan, and only a portion of that was constructed and then constructed to the uh, full uh, town standards. Uh, the last time we are here uh, was to request a waiver or reduction of the roadway improvements from 12 feet uh, to the 18 feet that was required on the 2003 plan. And the rationale for that, again, was the character in terms of the subdivision. It is only a four-lot uh, subdivision, uh, and it does have a fair distance as far as side, uh, side areas for uh, shoulders. And we had a site walk with the board, as the board remembers, and there was some discussion because we wanted to see what this site looked like. And we walked through the entire area all the way back up in here. And some of the concern was where it had been approved for the 18-foot uh, wide improvements the last time around, and that the first lot that came in to pull a building permit was going to be responsible for the entire improvements. Uh, while there was a lot of discussion on the site walk, it wasn't very clear in which direction we were leaning in terms of making the improvements. And we've had subsequent discussions with Maureen, and in your packet this evening uh, goes over what some of her recommendations have been, and we've taken that to heart and looked at uh, what the options could be in terms of making improvements. And what we're looking at is making the improvements, as we had discussed, down on Old Ocean House and Old Sea Point Road intersection. The original proposal that you had had the 12-foot wide roadway expanding the radii at the entrance to 30 feet, uh, relocating the mailboxes that were on this side of the road to this side, and expanding the culvert to handle the grading. <laughs> In order to achieve the 15-foot width, what we're proposing to do is to increase that width to 18 feet and pave the first 15, uh, 50 feet of old, o old Ocean House Road in as required. And then after that would be to expand the roadway uh, by having expanding the gravel width on either side to by three feet to give you a cross section of the 18 feet. And extending that up 350 feet from Old Ocean House Road this, Old Ocean House Road and that 350 feet would take it to roughly here. When we're on the sidewalk, uh, Sally, in terms of looking where her house may be, is roughly in this location here, and we had talked about a possible driveway location here. What we're looking at now is shifting that driveway back down. Uh, there's a knoll in here where the house would be, and this would be another logical location to bring the driveway in. So what we're proposing to do is, as I said, the three-foot gravel shoulders on either side from here up 350 feet. And then, okay, now I've done it. Can I use the arrows back? Okay. Right there. to get the WB-40 uh, vehicle turning radius in there for the fire equipment. You're showing an 18-foot wide paved area and then expanding the gravel on either side in order to get the appropriate radius and the turning movement for the uh, a piece of fire equipment to get in. As part of Maureen's recommendations uh, in your packet is that when the next lot, whether it be lot two or any subsequent division of the land, would be responsible for the additional improvements which would include the turnaround up in here. The driveway uh, on lot one would act as a, a temporary intermediate turnaround for now 
uh, but also being stabilized. We still have the ability as to function as a turnaround on this site. Uh, the grassed area would be, gravel area on either side of the driveway would be uh, maintained in terms of a grass cover just so it doesn't look like a, a disturbed area. But the, uh, the gravel again on either side of the roadway would remain as gravel. The other thing we'd be looking at doing is the existing paved surface uh, in order to achieve the proper cross section. Uh, we would be resurfacing that portion of the, the paved area up to the 350 feet. Uh, part of the uh, application that we amended and submitted back to Maureen on the 10th uh, was for a resource protection permit for the wetland crossing for the two water services that have to come in. Uh, the rationale the last time we discussed this with the board, uh, the town engineer had suggested why not bring it in along the roadway. The issue with the roadway, as we discussed on the sidewalk, is that there is ledge in various locations and it would require an extensive amount of removal in order to, to get the water line at the depth. And what we're looking at in this location is about 1,500 square feet of temporary impact. Uh, we're looking at a 10-foot wide area uh, in order to do the construction. Uh, we're providing erosion control around either side. Removal of existing organic material along that trench area to reserve the material, install the water lines, bring it back, uh, finish grade back up to the existing grades adjacent to the disturbance with that reserve material overseeding with a wetland seed mix and then what will happen is whatever seed population is within that wetland soil uh, profile will also generate additional vegetation to basically restore that area to uh, its current conditions. Uh, in terms of the road, I'm going to miss this, uh, this is just to give you kind of a highlighted cross section of what we're talking about as far as the roadway. Here's your 12-foot paved surface that's in there now, and providing the three additional three feet on either side. Side sloping it with the grades uh, need to be adjusted in order to meet that 2% uh, crown along the road section and retaining existing vegetation along the side. As we had said uh, the last time we were out on the sidewalk, there were a number of trees uh, along the left-hand side of the road that <laughs> are going in that are pretty much marginal condition and those would be removed and there's a couple of them that have to be removed in order to do some of the roadway improvements. Uh, that's pretty much a summary of where we are uh, uh, at this present time based on discussions with Maureen and the site walk and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Before we have any questions we, we need to call the public hearing and then Take that into consideration with our questions. Would you questions. like me to put it back to a plan? Pardon? Would you like it back to a full plan? A full plan uh, up on the screen? Sure. The arrow key is more. Um, we can just go back to the back arrow. There we go. Okay. <coughs> okay. We'll open the public hearing, and if anybody would like to speak about Old Sea Point Road subdivision, please come to the podium and identify yourself. My name is Bruce Mills. I uh, live at uh, 20 Old Sea Point Road, which is the, the house at the end of the road on the left-hand side. Um, I guess the question I had was, uh, originally there was some proposed work on the uh, turnaround at, uh, at the very end of the road. Could you um, elaborate on, on um, what you plan to do? Has anything changed uh, since our initial discussions? Uh, right now, uh, we will not be making those improvements at this point. Uh, whoever comes in either develop lot two or if there's any further division of the land that's serviced by our fronts on Old Sea Point Road, it would be their responsibility to make those improvements. <laughs> but right now, it is right in the board, where the driveway will be to service lot, <clears throat> serve lot one, that will be designed basically to accommodate the turnaround of an emergency vehicle. Do you have a, a rough uh, count of how many trees would have to come down to accommodate the wide, the widening at the at the beginning of the road? Let me go back to the photographs. I can probably show you. <clears throat> These three right in here. 
you know, you look at the, the crown of those, there's virtually very little life left in those. Those would have to come down anyway from a safety standpoint. So those three would definitely come out. And along the right-hand side, it's more the understory material that's going to come out. There may be one free back up in here that have to come. But basically on this side, in order <coughs> to get that width in there, it doesn't look like we're taking that many trees out. Okay. Initially, we had a bump out as well. Has that been removed? Could you yeah. speak up so we could hear, please? Um, initially, there was a proposal for a bump out. Uh, has that been removed from the application? Yes, that has been removed. My wife and I would support this plan as it stands, as it is applied for. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else who would like to come up and speak? not, the public hearing is closed, and Bob, if you'll come back, we'll open it up to the board. <coughs> Questions for the, from the board? I don't have any questions. I just think this, based on the site walks, plural, and the um, feedback that we've got from the neighbors, it seems like a fair compromise, given all the um, potential for development and existing development out there. So basically, I'm in support of what's out there with this, this proposal. Anybody else? I have some questions. Um, is there any improvements planned for the pavement as it is, exists today? <clears throat> the only change that we're going to have as far as the pavement is concerned will be from the 50 foot section from Old, o Old Ocean House Road in will be completely paved. It'll include the three feet expansion on either side. And then the existing bituminous paved surface will be overlaid from this point up to where the driveway goes in and actually get to the right there. Basically it would be paved, resurfaced up to this point here. Okay. okay. Is that what you asked? Meaning, oh, just over the area there. Your resurface mean? Just an overlay. Overlay, like an inch and a half? Roughly an inch and a half is going to vary. Again, to get your crown it. back, because cool. I remember the sidewalk, the pavement was pretty. Uh, there's, little, there's some undulation in there. Yeah. You're bringing that back up in order to get the 2% cross picture on right. your side. And the reason for um, having only 12 feet of pavement versus 18, is that just cost? Part of it is, but the other thing still comes down to aesthetics. If all of a sudden we're looking at a full 18 feet wide of pavement, it's going to still have that negative or an adverse visual impact as you're looking in onto the property. And while your private road standard doesn't require it to be paved, uh, it could be a gravel road. We're obviously not going to look at taking out what's paved, and, uh, but we're resurfacing, as I said, that portion in order to, to better achieve the grading uh, that we need on that cross section. Okay, thanks. Okay. Huh? Bob, the slopes off of the end of the gravel surface, something that's going to get quickly back to the, you know, whatever, trying to blend back in with the, with the existing woods as quick as possible. Is that the intent? That you, is the you, intent. Do you have any sense of what that would be? Or? The, the side slopes on that section, the only one that's probably at the steep, steeper gradient is probably this section in here, mm -hmm. uh, which we're probably looking at have to probably go from the edge of that, probably back down at about a, a three to one. As you move along this side and getting up into these upper reaches, there's not an awful lot of grade change coming across, so it'll almost blend right into the existing uh, grade along the edge of the roadway. Okay. Thank you. I, I also concur with Peter. I think this is a, a reasonable compromise, the one that is being proposed. I, I have one question, and maybe the question's for Maureen. Uh, what about the maintenance agreement to maintain it? Is there a prior maintenance agreement since there are already two homes on this road? I want to say yes, but I, I cannot guarantee that. So I think if it's a concern you have, it should probably be addressed as a condition of approval. Well, that would be for all the homeowners, though. Well, They'd the, all have to agree. This is the conundrum. You can't make anybody but the current applicant do something. <laughs> Such a tough situation. That's do you know whether there's an agreement at all about the road? I do not, and I can ask Sally whether or not she has. Would you like to 
there is a maintenance agreement. It's split fairly between the three property owners right now, and I assume lot two, if that's developed there, it's also their responsibility as well. Is that on the title record or just by agreement? Title record. Title. Oh, okay, good. She was saying All right, because sometimes that can be an issue. create huge problems afterwards. But I, I'm with the rest of the board. I, I concur that this is it's a difficult situation. The, the only question I have is, is it going to be very clear in everything that the next person who comes along is going to have to finish this road? And how do we make sure that it's very clear that whomever buys that lot has to complete this too? I wonder how. I mean, we have it in, in the... Has to complete what? Has to complete the road. The next person who buys a lot two has to complete the road. And this situation in part occurred because when the building <laughs> permit was applied for, suddenly the buyers were faced with an unknown situation. And here we want to make sure that that doesn't happen the next time that whomever buys that lot knows they have to... How would they know unless the real estate agent knew about it? Well, that's what I'm saying. Is there any way that we can somehow or other make this very clear? And I don't know how that <laughs> is. But is there a way, Maureen? Oh, I'm still looking up the maintenance agreement, and I, I haven't found it signed. But there well, is Ma a while Maureen's looking at that, I'll try and respond to but part how, of that question. But I, I have found a 2001 document that I assume there's another copy in here that is actually signed that um, covers the three lots that are on the south side of the road. So you do have an existing maintenance agreement. And to answer your other question, the, the proposal in the memo didn't just tie it to lot two. It tied it to any future building permit for access off of old Seapoint Road. So it wouldn't necessarily be lot two that would trigger the remaining improvements. It, w it could be another it could lot. Be any that lot. And as for clarity, I believe that the current um, the current approval was very clear. I think the uh, owner knew that when they purchased the lot. It was just that they then sought changes to that. So you can make this approval very clear, and that will not preclude a future property owner from still asking for other changes. Okay. Well, since it's in our, we're going to put it in as part of our condition. I guess there's nothing else we can do. So any other questions? <laughs> Memo for the board to consider, or I, motion. Excuse me, motion for the board to consider. Excuse me. Barbara. Go ahead. Um, I have a motion for the board to consider. I move that we make the following findings of fact. Uh, Ms. Sally Crockett is requesting an amended amendment to the previously approved the old Seapoint Road subdivision to reduce the required width of the travel surface from old Seapoint Road from 18 feet to the existing width of 12 feet with a pull-off area and resource protection permit to install water lines, which require review under section 16-2-5 subdivision amendments and section 19-8-3 resource protection permit. Two, the town engineer has identified construction details that should be revised to be in compliance with town <coughs> Three, the applicant is proposing to install water lines in an RP2 wetland instead of within the road right of way to avoid the cost of removing ledge. Four, Old Sea Point Road has not in the past, nor does it now meet town road standards. Five, the application substantially complies with section 16-2-5 subdivision amendments and section 19-8-3 resource protection permit standards. And I move that, be, therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Ms. Sally Crockett for an amendment to the previously approved Old Sea Point Road subdivision to reduce the required width of the travel surface from Old Sea Point Road from 18 feet to the existing width of 12 feet with a pull-off area and a resource protection permit to install water lines be approved subject to the following conditions, that the plans be revised to address the town engineer's letter of September 10, 2007, paragraphs two and three, that both water service lines be installed at the same time to minimize wetlands disturbance. Three, that no building permit be issued for lot one until an engineered 
registered in the state of Maine confirms that Old Sea Point Road has been constructed as follows. A, the first 350 feet of Old Sea Point Road is widened, including adequate gravel base in accordance with the town subdivision ordinance road standards to an 18 foot wide traveled surface. B, radius improvements at the intersection with Old Ocean House Road as detailed in the plans and see the first 40 feet of their driveway off Old Sea Point Road to town turnaround with standards. Four, that no building permit for lot two or any other lot created with access to Old Sea Point Road be issued until an engineer registered in the state of Maine confirms that Old Sea Point Road has been constructed as follows. A, the portion of Old Sea Point Road extending 350 feet west of Old Ocean House Road to the end is widened, including adequate gravel base in accordance with the town subdivision ordinance road standards to an 18 foot wide traveled surface. And the turnaround located at the end of Old Sea Point Road is constructed to town standards. Five, that the plans be revised to delete the pull off area. <coughs> Six, that there be no alteration of the site nor issuance of a building permit until the plans are revised to, the, to address the above conditions and submitted to the town planner. Second. Uh, is there any more discussion? Yes, Scott. On uh, 4B, is the turnaround still being constructed to town, town standards? That's for the second lot, when the second lot second is lot. in. The current turnaround. Oh, I see. I got it. Yeah. Three is lot one, which is the present. Okay. Anybody else? Oh. Point of clarification, Bob. Are you proposing to do the first 40 or the first 50 feet of the road? Is, is, is well, I have a feeling I read the ordinance wrong. I said 50. It would be the 40 feet if that's what the requirement is. Thank you. It's 50, isn't it? Said this 40 feet came. Uh, from the yeah, 40 feet comes off of item C of condition three. Mm -hmm. And the reason I used 40 feet is that is the um, the right of way width for a turnaround. That's the driveway. For the driveway. And the pavement, in fact, oh. the pavement says 10 feet for a private access way. Off, you know, the, off Old Ocean off House Road. Off Old Ocean House Road. You're into the private road standards. And well, I guess maybe I don't have your current copy because when I looked at it, it said greater. But, but you're into the private road feet. standards anyway. Okay, right. so, so we can take it. What you're proposing is well within what we yeah. would accept. Okay. So there are two different things. I, has the um, town engineer, have the town engineer and the fire chief agreed that? This, this is a compromise that was worked up at um, Friday afternoon, and you're the only ones that have seen it. So the, the town engineer has not commented on this. This is a proposal that I drafted for the planning board to consider based on the comments I had received from you regarding how you wanted to try to address the situation. The fire chief hasn't seen it and the town engineer hasn't seen it. Well, should we put a condition in about approval from the fire chief and the town engineer or? You can, but there's, a, there's also a chance that you will see it next month. You'll see it what? You'll see it again next month. Because my guess that. is the fire chief will want the, tur the full turnaround at the end of the road. A meeting at the top is part of this. So given, given that's more engineer, likely. And the town engineer has given you his recommendation. Right. I mean, he's, he's saying you should build the whole thing. And what I was hearing from board members was that they wanted something in right. the middle of right. that. Oh, I think we all do. We all feel that it's not fair to burden one property owner with a whole road. Yeah, if we're not gonna if we're not gonna seriously entertain requiring this applicant to go all the way to the end and build that turnout, you know, why you know, why and I think that's where you're leading to Maureen, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean this this was an attempt by me to kind of take what I'd heard from you right. and fashion it in a way that it it's balancing competing interests. I mean, if you're the fire chief, you want the uh, turnaround. If you're the town engineer, you want the whole road built to 18 feet wide. And if you're the planning board, you're trying to find some place in the middle. When you say 18 feet wide, you mean 18 foot 
18 feet of pavement plus no, shoulders? No, actually the town standard for private roads does not require that it be paved. Right. So when the applicant is saying, uh, by 18 feet wide, I mean an 18 feet wide travel surface. All the way to the end. Right. All the way to the end. All the way to the end, mm -hmm. where you meet the town standard right. Right. turnaround. <laughs> We've kind of gone over this too. I mean, that, that lot may never get sold and built. Okay, any more discussion? Well, I'm, I'm a little confused. How does this come back to the board next month? It won't if we don't well, make any. Oh, if we don't vote. Yeah. If we my, vote on this now, it won't. My, my point was that if you subject what you've just done to the, oh. the approval of the town engineer or the fire chief, there's a good chance We're back. they're going to say, you, we know no, we don't approve say. it. Okay. Okay. I'm good. Okay, are we ready for a vote? We, have a, we need a second, actually. We did have a second. Oh, did? Jim seconded. Oh, sorry. I missed that. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> any more discussion? All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. It was a good compromise. Okay, next item on our agenda is the Eastman Meadows subdivision. It's a town's five and a half year old laptop. Yeah, thank you. That's what I was thinking. So updated software as of last month. Acrobat five. Eight. Yeah, I know. It's not that. Probably not. I don't know. What she. <laughs> so, okay. All right. Introducing. Okay. Uh, good evening. My name is Owens McCullough, civil engineer with Sebago Technics here. Excuse me, Owens, could I ask you if you could make the Mike. microphone usable? Oh, no. It's right, it's I'll, I'll speak louder. Is that better? That would okay. be better no because problem. I'd like everybody to be able <laughs> sure. to hear what you say. Okay. Uh, I'll start over then. Uh, good evening. My name is Owens McCullough, civil engineer with the firm of Sebago Technics, here tonight on behalf of Wiley Enterprises for the Eastman Meadows condominium project. Uh, with me tonight in the audience is Joel Fitzpatrick of Wiley Enterprises, Mark Hampton of uh, Mark Hampton Associates, and Nathan Taylor, design engineer with our firm. Uh, we appreciated the opportunity to uh, meet with the board at a site walk. Actually, I think some of the members made a second site walk. I was at the Saturday site walk, and I guess I was fortunate enough to leave before the bees or the wasp came out. So, Barbara, Yellow okay. jackets, I think <laughs> That's they were. what I heard. Uh, tonight, uh, what we're hoping to do is to uh, continue the discussions from the site walk and the completeness review, uh, get some feedback from the board. This will be a public hearing. And then uh, once all that happens, uh, we hope to take all those comments and try to make another formal submittal back to the town uh, to continue with the review process. I'll take a few minutes just to go back and give you the highlights of, of the project. I think everybody by now is pretty familiar with it, but I'll sort of start uh, just a brief overview. Uh, this is the project site right here. It totals uh, just over a little over 40 acres of land. Uh, Joel uh, Wiley Enterprises has already purchased this parcel of land here. This parcel is owned by the Sprague Corporation 
and is under contract uh, purchase and sale agreement with Wiley Enterprises. Uh, the project is consisting of a condominium uh, project, 46 condominium units comprising of duplexes and a couple of quadruplex units and uh, with a 15,000 square foot farm lot here. And in a minute I'll go to the larger scale uh, site plan. One of the unique aspects of this project is it abuts um, a tremendous amount of open space in the town. And the project will include about 60%, actually on average a little more than 60% of the land that will be put in the open space, which provides an opportunity to complement uh, with the rest of the open space and trail system. Uh, we also are proposing to construct a trail, a couple of trails within the project that will connect into the, uh, uh, the town-owned space, I believe, Winnick Woods. And then there's another one over on the other side that would come around and also connect into the system. And those would be constructed uh, by the uh, applicant. This is zooming in onto the actual development area of the project. We're proposing to construct uh, two roads that come in, one here, and as I indicated at the site walk and um, at the previous meeting, the intent is to uh, build this to the town road standards uh, with a 50-foot right-of-way, and we may or may not uh, offer it for acceptance to the town. We'd like to give uh, the condominium uh, the chance to make that dis determination themselves. The other road, this is Tanninger Lane, the other road, Phoebe's Way, will remain private. It's actually going to be constructed to the same road standards that the first road is, is built to, 22 feet of pavement, esplanade, and sidewalk uh, with street trees along both sides of the road. Uh, the condominiums are uh, duplex, and there's a couple of quadruplexes, one here, and then one over in this location here. Uh, the project will most likely be developed in phases. The first phase will most likely occur in this area here. The second phase would com uh, complete the loop road of Tanninger Lane, and then the third phase would be uh, Phoebe's Way. Uh, depending on how sales go, the applicant may opt uh, to build more than one phase at a time. Um, the applicant actually has had a number of inquiries uh, into this sort of project, which is really targeted uh, towards the 55 and older group. And the applicant has had a number of uh, uh, calls um, making inquiries into that. Um, although it's not restricted to 55 and older, uh, we anticipate the way it's been laid out, the way it's been designed, the way the floor plans are set, that it's really only conducive to um, that sort of uh, demographics. Uh, if you, the floor plans on the units are are uh, two bedrooms, um, single floor units. Uh, the project really isn't set up for uh, families and kids. There's no playgrounds or anything like that in it. It's, there's an association uh, that is set up as part of it. Uh, will be restricted on what can be done. Um, in and around the uh, development. There will be some very um, aggressive landscaping within the development of the project. Uh, that landscaping will be maintained by the association through dues. Utilities servicing the project will be public uh, water, sewer, underground electric telephone and cable services. Uh, there's public water on Eastman Road that stops right here. We will have to extend the water to this location and then there'll be a loop system within the development. Sanitary sewer will include a uh, gravity system within the development that conveys down to a pump station in this location. And then we will be installing a force main up Eastman Road up to the gravity sewer. And as we come along Eastman Road through discussions with the town, we will be stubbing uh, to the existing houses uh, so that if we're, which are all on septic, which they could have the option at some point to tie into that sewer, into that sewer service. Stormwater within the development uh, will be collected in a storm drain system by sheet flow, shallow concentrated flow, storm drain pipings. They'll be piped to 
uh, filtration areas which are compliant with the new uh, stormwater management laws focusing on um, quality. Uh, we will also meet the quantity standard. In addition, there's one in this location, another one over here. Uh, there's another filtration area in here. And I believe there's five uh, total on the project site. And these filtration areas I'm going to um, are, as I think tried to explain at the site walk earlier, uh, they're shallow uh, depressions that collect stormwater. They filter them through a, a bed of sand and then get collected in an underdrain system and piped to the outlet. And the soil media is a specification developed by the DEP, which has evolved <laughs> over time. <laughs> I'm sure I know Scott has had to deal with this too. Um, and so that, that is intended to treat the stormwater and then discharge it to an outlet. Because this project will ultimately be reviewed by the DEP under, a, under the site location law, we have to meet both the quality and the quantity standard for the project. Uh, which leads me kind of into the, to the next piece. Actually, I want to just show you the floor plants and the building units before I go too much further. This is an artist rendering of what the units will look like. Um, they are one story. This is the duplex layout. Uh, vinyl siding, uh, offset roof lines, uh, driveways, and landscaping around uh, the units with sidewalk entries and front porches for the project. Uh, several of the units will have two car garages. There are a few units that would have uh, one car uh, garages associated with them. And the floor plan. This is a typical floor plan layout. Uh, garage, um, bedroom, uh, bedroom, living room. And I think that's a sun sunroom uh, covered porch in that location with the kitchen in here and then the garage. Uh, as I indicated, these are specifically designed and intended, and, and really the whole marketing plan is to target the 55 and older. While we're not restricting the project to that, um, we anticipate that this will really be the attraction of the project. I've had the opportunity to work on a number of other condominium projects uh, in southern Maine and uh, for another uh, prominent developer who is really focused on this sort of development. And they typically see uh, around less than 5% of the units that have any sort of kids or families involved with them. They're, they're all structured so that the association documents, the layout, the design, it's just really not set up for, for families to come into it. So, uh, but we don't, you know, there could be that occasional family that comes into it. We also could have uh, young professionals that might want to uh, have some units that, that don't have kids or don't, aren't planning to have kids. So there could be some, you know, in, in that category. So we want to leave some flexibility into it, but it has been designed and set up so that we're going to try to tap a very specific market. And I'll go back to the site plan. Uh, when we were, since our last uh, meeting with the board um, and our, our site walk, uh, we've also um, had moved the project along with the DEP to include uh, a pre-application meeting with the uh, main DEP for the site location permit. Uh, Bob Green is the project uh, manager assigned to this project. We actually invited uh, Maureen O'Mara and the town engineer to attend that pre-application meeting, uh, which they did. We thought that were there sort of parallel reviews going on, it would make some sense to have some cohesiveness. So uh, Maureen and Steve uh, attended that meeting uh, with us. Uh, we also had a public informational meeting uh, right here in the town in the town office. That's a requirement uh, before we actually file the site location permit, which uh, we hope to file within the next uh, couple of, of weeks. <coughs> As part of the recent uh, submittal and, and ongoings of the project. Uh, we also provided a revised community impact assessment for the project. Um, as expected, this type of project, um, just simply and mostly because it doesn't interject kids into the school system, shows a net 
uh, tax generation for the town uh, for a project like this. Uh, we also um, had a peer review of our traffic study that was completed by uh, Tom Errico of Wilbur Smith Associates. Uh, Tom's uh, traffic study uh, letter that came back is included, I think, in your packets. Um, a couple of things there. Uh, Tom looked at the, at the uh, traffic generation, and uh, one of the first comments I think that Tom talked about was that um, 70%, you know, we, we said 70% of the development would we expect to be the 55 and older generation with 30% potentially others. Uh, Tom uh, indicated that, you know, what happens if that doesn't. Um, and looking at the traffic, he said even if that didn't happen, um, his comment was that the roadway system has adequate capacity to absorb the increased traffic from a project of this type. Uh, so that is in the uh, review memorandum. I, I guess what I would say is that um, we feel strongly and we have designed this um, and based on other projects of this type, we expect that we will, we will meet that 70% and probably exceed it uh, for the project. And the applicant um, has already had interest. In, uh, all of it has been uh, for that 55 and older um, age range. Um, a couple of the other, uh, one of the other items that has come, that, uh, was mentioned uh, dealt with site distance in this traffic study. Uh, historically, we have uh, used uh, the uh, road classification stand uh, table for site distance measurements. It's been something we've uh, used on other projects. Uh, Tom looked at another standard uh, that was included in the ordinance uh, and indicated that uh, using that standard uh, then we would uh, not meet the site distance. Uh, in particular, at this lower entrance looking this way, and at the upper entrance looking that way, it's this area right here because of the vertical curve in Eastman Road. Uh, we uh, have strived to be consistent in how we've used the, and measured the site distance following that road classification uh, standard. Um, if the board um, elected to have us go with the other uh, standard that uh, Tom made reference to, uh, we can certainly do that. Uh, we've looked at that. Uh, we can, it would require the clearing of vegetation along uh, this side of the road, and we would, uh, well, we're in, we would have to take down the hill about a foot and a half uh, to get uh, to the site distance requirement uh, that Tom talked about. And, and I think what I'd like to say in all of that, you know, we certainly can do that, uh, but it, in my experiences and my understanding of how the town has looked at um, uh, traffic and site distance and the road systems, they, they strive to um, have a policy that uh, promoted um, slower speeds of traffic on roadways. And one way to do that is to create a perception um, with lesser site distances, narrower roads, so that people didn't have that comfort that you might have if you have a wider road with uh, lesser vertical and horizontal curves. I mean, the reality is if you can see and you can, and the road looks wide and, and, and great site distance that people will drive faster along the road. So um, it almost seems uh, counter to how the town has looked at trying to uh, control um, speed and traffic um, by implementing policies that, that promoted slower speeds. And if we take down that knoll and go to a higher site distance, it almost seems counter to the direction that I, that I think uh, we've gone on in the past. Um, I, I mentioned that you know under 16-3-2 of the road design and construction standards, I, I think that provides uh, some guidance in that, you know, the standards, one of the statements is the standard shall have, uh, shall be flexible where the applicant uh, can uh, de demonstrate alternative approaches to meet, uh, meet, meet the goals and policies of the town. And, and I think we've tried to do that. Uh, we'll leave that up to the board. If they decide we need to go to the other standard, we can take, we can lower that vertical curve and, and increase the site distance. But again, I'm a little concerned that that might be somewhat counter to the policies in the past. Uh, the other uh, item I wanted to speak to briefly was uh, in your packets a letter from the fire chief 
uh, the fire chief indicated that uh, the water line, the hydrant data in this area indicated that uh, the flow was less than a thousand gallons per minute and that as a result uh, the standard he wanted to try to meet for the project was a, is a thousand gallons per minute minimum for firefighting. Uh, the fire hydrant data that we had originally supplied with the application we noticed was from 1994 or 95. Um, so we actually had since contacted the Portland Water District and had the Portland Water District create a completely new hydrant flow test uh, following the NFPA requirements and the flow is actually 1,085 gallons per minute uh, for the project and I think we've, if we haven't provided that paperwork we certainly will. It's been sent to Joel Fitzpatrick uh, once they've completed the test. So I, I think uh, what that shows there's been some modification somewhere in the system over those years that brings that flow up to, to where the chief would like to see it. Um, another item that I wanted to uh, speak about was um, the wetland uh, delineation on the project. Uh, during the site walk, um, and there's been a lot of ensuing correspondence sent into the town uh, regarding uh, the wetlands, uh, some concerns uh, about the wetland mapping. Um, and what uh, there was also, uh, we understand at one point, an assertion that the developer uh, stripped and grubbed or filled an area down in this location. And um, Joel, the applicant, actually uh, recalled after we had been on the site walk that um, back in February, some, a neighbor, somebody, reportedly called the main DEP and Chris Copey from the main DEP responded and has issued uh, a letter of no violation or it's actually a form that they prepare when they come out that there was nothing wrong. What the applicant had been doing back in that time was some test pits looking for ledge, looking at soil conditions and the applicant had bush hogged uh, the old farm field. So. Um, but the DEP responded to that and indicated there was no violation. So I wanted to try to make sure that that was known. The other thing that we did in trying to be proactive um, because of that concern was we contacted uh, Rod Howe at the Army Corps of Engineers and we contacted Bob Green at the main DEP and asked them to do a peer review, a site walk, to review the wetlands. And that had been scheduled for last Friday um, and then it rained very hard. Uh, but they were kind enough to uh, reschedule for this past Monday uh, on short notice and came down at 1.30 in the afternoon. Uh, Mark Hampton and Joel Fitzpatrick attended that uh, meeting with Rod Howe and Bob Green. Uh, they were there for uh, a couple of hours uh, on site. They walked the property. And in particular, they looked at um, uh, the potential for streams on the prop property. There was uh, some comments made that there might be a stream over on this side of the property. Uh, Bob Green uh, reviewed that and made a determination that that in fact is not a stream over there, uh, that it is, it's a drainage run. Um, so we did take care of that one. Uh, they also walked the property and looked at the wetland delineation. Uh, my understanding is, and Mark Hampton is here, so if the board has specific questions of Mark Hampton who delineated the wetlands, I'm sure he'll speak to this. Uh, my understanding is, as they walked it, they looked at uh, the wetland delineation uh, felt that uh, the delineation uh, was was representative of the site. Uh, there was one area that planning board member, uh, not planning, some members of the public during the site walk uh, had expressed concern over, which is an area right in here. So the applicant, uh, being forthright, brought the Army Corps uh, and DEP right down into this area. My understanding is they spent considerable time looking at that area because this was an agricultural field so the land had been tilled over the years and disturbed and moved around. And after a considerable amount of time and looking at the soils and the vegetation and the hydrology in the area, um, it, they determined it was very marginal. Um, so what uh, ended up happening was it was agreed that they would classify it as a wetland in that area, a small chunk of, of area in here. And what Mark Hampton has done um, is uh, remap that area uh, in this location here and we will add it to the plans and make adjustments as appropriate. But I, we felt very strongly that uh, based upon the comments we wanted to make sure that the board had a comfort level with 
what was done, so we went right to the regulators and asked them to come down and review the site, just trying to be very forthright in, in, in the whole project. Um, so uh, with that, that brings us kind of current uh, to where we're at on the project. Uh, one of the things that we would be asking uh, the board to do tonight uh, after we get some comment is our hope is to take your comments, uh, comments from the public, um, and comment that we've received previously from the town engineer and staff and then assemble all that to make another formal submittal back to the town um, so that we can go forward with all that in one submittal instead of a bunch of little submittals coming in. And we would be looking for the board to potentially table the project until the December meeting uh, so that we could assemble any revised plans and information and comments that the board may have. So with that, I can leave this uh, sketch up. Uh, we'll turn it back to the board. We're here to answer questions, and I know it's a public meeting, so I will sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll hold our questions and comments and until after the public hearing, if everybody's in agreement. And I'll now call the public hearing to order. Um, please loudly state your name and address. We're going to ask you, if all of you are going to speak, um, I'm going to ask that you limit your comments to mo no more than about four minutes. Uh, I can assure you that your emails, those of you who have sent them, have been received. They've been read, and they are all being taken into consideration. The applicant also gets copies of everything that you say, too. Once you email to Maureen or you send Maureen a letter, it becomes part of the official record. So the uh, hearing is now open. And would you please come on up and make your comments? Thank you. Richard Carlson, 79 Eastman Road. I have a whole lot of pamphlets here I can pass out to the board. And if somebody would like to pass them down, follow through. Can you show us where you live? Probably? Sure, I'd be happy to. Mind if I use this? Uh, Maureen. Maureen? Don't point at anyone's eye. Yes. I live roughly in this area here. Actually, I'm, I have about 1,600 feet on the opposite side of the road. Um, uh, it's currently, I, I own 26 acres on the opposite side of the road as a horse farm. I've been there for about 13 years. Um, as I said, I, I'm a neighbor of the proposed development at, uh, and reside at 79 Eastman Road. Um, I, I thought it was, uh, I believed it was known that I was an unsuccessful um, purchase attempt on the relevant parcel. Um, I, and I also was a former friend of the late Gladys Sullivan. Uh, so with the amount of years that I've been there, I have intimate knowledge and strong in interest in the course and direction this property takes. Uh, to that end, and the reason as outlined below of what you have, um, I urge the planning board to require peer review of the wetland evaluation presented by Wiley, uh, by Wiley Enterprises uh, and a slope verification of the open space property of the Spray Corporation. Um, first and foremost, the wetland alteration, which is now uh, apparently been deemed by the Army Corps of Engineers after the fact to uh, be something that uh, needed to be addressed. Um, as you, it can be denoted, it's uh, in the basic junction of phases one, two, and three, and is which is identified on sheet two of, your, of, the, of the plans. And um, as I was reviewing this area prior to Joel's purchase, or Wiley Enterprises' purchase, um, it was mentioned to me that this was an area of at least RP2. Um, at this point, that area was, has been completely altered. And at the time, I, I was not aware um, of any regulation or any permitting uh, granted 
for that alteration. Also, there is nothing in the public file that says the DEP had made any comment um, to that this, uh, at the time of February 2nd, was not uh, deemed as an area of RP2. Um, I've, I've given you also uh, on subsequent pages aerial shots that will denote um, the areas that I'm questioning as altered. The, um, the first page uh, is a shot taken as, as pointed out on the first, pa uh, the first page. Uh, it was taken in August, on August 12th, 2004. The second page is September 19th of 2007. Uh, following, the following six pages are um, also additional images that were supplied to me um, of, in April of 2007 of uh, those alterations. Sorry, I would have made a PowerPoint presentation, but I didn't know I could you, you didn't need to bring a PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. These are fine. Thank you. Um, I feel that, uh, you know, with this uh, information, it should be considered uh, to provide the DEP uh, this information and um, the code enforcement officer to determine the value and any further action that may be required. And if that needs to be on my part, I'll, I'll pursue that. Um, in addition, uh, wetland identification, um, the purchase and sale uh, agreement with the Spray Corporation um, of the additional land for this development to meet the density requirements for the proposed number of units on this property. Uh, there is an area of RP1 that, um, in reviewing that parcel, uh, was flagged by, I assuming, Mark uh, Hampton, the site evaluator, on the southernmost end of the Spray Corporation land. The wetland is not represented in any plans made to the public to date. So, in addition, the Spray Corporation topography shows slopes exceeding 20%. I feel that there should be a, an exact slope verification um, for density purposes. Because if it's in excess of two acres, that density needs to be removed as a consideration for the number of units available for this project. To me, to make this uh, an acceptable site plan for proper density consideration, these, area needs, these areas need to be identified on the site plan. And you can see that in um, a subsequent page um, that it identifies that area. These are GPS markings, and unfortunately, the individual that took them is not available tonight. Um, but on his return, um, I will ask him to send a letter to Maureen uh, to verify who he is and how he came about to give these exact GPS coordinates on that site. Um, wetland setbacks, my concerns are, um, as I understand it, uh, you know, within an RP1, there needs to be a 250 foot setback of the critter wetland in areas greater uh, of two acres in size. According to um, page two of the Eastman, Eastman Meadow subdivision project, the plan appears to have a 250-foot setback from the larger portion of the RP1 and not the smaller contiguous portion of RP1. <clears throat> um, the ordinance of 1925E, which states the code enforcement officer or the planning board may exclude areas beyond the point where the wetland is less than 100 feet in width for a distance of more than 100 feet with reference to the 250-foot setback of an RP1. Um, this should not be an assumed exemption uh, but the planning board should be specifically asked to rule on this issue with rationale given for the exemption due to the sensitive nature of the Trout Brook watershed. Without that exclusion, the setback distance do not meet the requirements for the existing RP zone. And I've highlighted that, um, that area on the subsequent page. Even if the determination through a peer review shows that that narrow gap is not quite 70 feet, or it could be uh, 90 feet, it could be 110 feet. It could change 
how the RP2 zoning, or the, the, set, uh, the 250 foot setback of an RP1 is considered, let alone the fact that this is an assumed exemption. Uh, um, this project targets, um, is a target in an adult or 55 plus community. Um, but there are no specific deed restrictions stipulating age restriction. There should be um, additional measures taken for better guarantees targeting that adult buyer. One consider consideration could be a two bedroom maximum written into the association bylaws, and, and that could be the case, I I'm not sure. Um, I don't know if there's any um, height restrictions to add something over um, what appears to be a common garage adjoining so that their uh, additional bedrooms couldn't be added over there. I'm, I'm not sure, but something should be um, specifically targeted within uh, the, I guess, condominium, <coughs> condominium, condominium project that stipulates that um, it, this really can't be something that could bump out on additional units. Um, given the scale of I'm going to give project, you one more minute. Okay, fine, so other people have a chance. Seconds. Given the scale of the project, its impact to the uh, entire town of Cape Elizabeth, as well as the uh, location within the Trout Cliff watershed, I'm, I'm sure the planning board will ex um, exercise great caution in ensuring that it meets the strictest guidelines of the Cape Elizabeth subdivision and zoning ordinances. Um, I hope that this information finds uh, abuse to you, and I appreciate your consideration and concern on this project. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Thank you for the photographs. Sure. My name is David Plumpton, 1000 Sawyer Road. I live about 0.7 miles from the project. And uh, my biggest concern tonight here is that I not be blamed for, for keeping anyone from watching the Red Sox game. So I'm <laughs> going to be brief. And I have uh, submitted uh, extensive comments, and I won't go over those. But I wanted to take a few minutes to uh, give you sort of a global perspective. And I don't speak for the neighborhood, but I think a lot of people feel this way. And that is, for the last couple of years, we've been trying to draw attention to the problems of traffic, uh, uh, expanded growth, and so forth. And in March of this year, 28 people on Sawyer and Stillman sent uh, a petition to the town about concerns about the roadways, the prospect of Eastman Meadows, and quite frankly, these, these concerns have not been taken into account, and we now have a comprehensive plan which actually focuses growth on our area, which I think is bad public policy, but that's been done. And actually, this is an area, by the way, with recent growth, but <coughs> relative to the rest of the town, it has a lot of open space, wetlands, trout brook uh, area, it has farms, one of which is being lost by this. And uh, so what you have here is what I think is a discriminatory action by the town to target our area for growth, combined with clustered housing and the concentration of many units on an area surrounded totally by wetlands. And I just think that's a bad idea. I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's right. But we have the zoning we have. We have, uh, you know, the, the, the things in the comprehensive plan which are good, which protect wetlands, and uh, only ask for reasonable growth. So what I think I'm saying to the planning board is I think that you should use your discretion and your judgment to limit the scope of this development and to take into account carefully the impact that it's going to have and to use your discretion not to give the developer a blank slate, but do things like, for example, sidewalks along Eastman Road. I still don't know whether there's been a traffic study uh, that, that shows exactly what the speeds are and what the traffic is. I can tell you that on, on Sawyer Road, we have a very narrow road, and this whole idea of traffic calming is, is not working, but I'm working with the chief and other people are to try to come up with things that will stop the speed. But the idea that a narrow road impedes speed is absolutely wrong. 
It just doesn't work. You see people going 50, 60 miles an hour on Sawyer and Eastman. So I think there should be sidewalks on Eastman if you're going to approve this development. I think there ought to be more subtractions, which you have, which aren't all covered in what the developers presented, subtractions from net residential area to limit the, the number of units. And there should be a wetland setback of 250 feet from the edge of the wetlands, not this 70-foot thing, which apparently the, the planning board could approve, but it hasn't been asked for or done. And you know, th this, this is what we need to protect us from this massive development, which will be 4.6 times <laughs> in, in one fell swoop of the total number of houses built in the Cape last year, which were 10. So we're being asked to bear a huge part of the burden for the growth in Cape Elizabeth. And growth is going to happen. And we've been singled out as a growth area. And that's the public policy. We disagree with it. But the least you can do is, is carefully, and I know you will, but I just want to emphasize the importance to the residents of making sure that this is a development of reasonable scope given the wetlands, the impact, and the, and the area around it. So I appreciate your, your uh, efforts and, and for uh, listening to my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. That's actually a little bit longer to get here. It's okay, you take your time getting there. Well, my name is Harry Smith. My wife Claire and I uh, bought a house recently on Sawyer Road. One of the reasons we like the Could you give us your address, sir? Pardon me? Could you give your address for the record, uh, please? 999 Sawyer Road. <laughs> One of the reasons we liked the neighborhood was that it didn't have developments like the one proposed. When I was growing up, I saw the farms and forests of my town destroyed by developments. Once they're gone, you can't get them back. If you approve such a project, I suggest that you drive on other roads besides Eastman because you regret it every time you looked at it. And, you know, I speak from experience because my family sold some of that land to developers. Uh, it might not have seemed like a bad idea at the time, more money, growth, and all of that, but you have to think about what attracts people to Cape Elizabeth and well, people like us wouldn't be attracted you know if, if there were more things like like the one I've seen tonight thank you thank you would anybody else like to speak It's your chance. Hello, my name is Mary Steve, and I live at 28 Eastman Road. And it's hard to follow everyone that spoke already tonight because everyone, I think, feels strongly about this proposed condominium project. But Eastman Road is one of the most beautiful roads in Cape Elizabeth. We don't have shoreline like the rest, the majority of the town, but it is a beautiful country road and people use it. I mean, we've talked a lot about the traffic, and really people use that road for running, walking with their children, riding bikes. They're, it's not the safest road. There's a lot of twists and turns, and um, there's kids on the road, and it just seems like it goes against what makes us love, you know, Eastman Road. And other people say, oh, that's such a beautiful road. Um, and it just has charm, and it seems like the proposed condominium complex takes away from what we love and why we love it. Um, and I have four children, and one of my, well, we live on a really bad curb on Eastman Road, 
and um, that's the way it is, but I have a blind son, and the kids have to walk to their buses as they get older. Um, it does concern me the amount of traffic. I'm not, I'm not sure that, um, I know they said that they did a revised traffic study. It still seems hard to imagine that traffic wouldn't be increased, and I know it's not their problem about the speeds and everything, because those are issues too. But it is a nice road, and it's a great place to live, and we really don't want to see it you know, happen what's proposed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Emma Houghton. I live at 265 Spurlink Avenue. Uh, I don't live on Eastman, but I do live uh, close to it. Uh, the biggest concern I have, and something that was mentioned earlier, is congestion of that uh, development. Um, we talked about, you said it was 40 acres, 40 acre parcel, is that correct, Joel? Okay. <clears throat> what is the acreage where the footprint of the condominiums, condominiums is going to be? That looks smaller than the 40 acres that was noted. Um, I also wonder is, uh, you know, what is the required square footage allotment allowed for condominiums, you know, here in Cape Elizabeth? I've seen different sizes of, you know, go to Cross Hill, pretty congested. Um, go to uh, Starboard uh, condominiums, the older condomin condominiums down by Wells Road, kind of shoved together. Um, and the job that I do, I get to go see some of these new condominiums. Um, these look kind of boring, kind of stale, kind of sterile. Um, I think we need to work with the environment. I, I, I'm not going to say that Joel can't build there, uh, but I think whatever is built should fit the need of the area. Okay, it was a farmland. There are horses just down the street. Let's make it look like it fits into the environment and not just something sterile and I'm trying to make a profit by building, you know, 46 uh, units. Let's also consider uh, us who live in the neighborhood, who live on Eastman, who live on Spurwin, okay, Alexander Drive. You know, we are here first. We're going to welcome these people into our neighborhood, but let's have them, you know, fit and, and come in. You know, when I hear this is going to be targeted for 50-something people, okay, I'm pretty close to that. I wouldn't want to live there, okay, uh, unless it looked really nice and attractive to me. What I saw up on the, on the uh, screen here, eh, I'm not so sure. So, you know, maybe <coughs> these guys need to rethink what they're going to put in there, all right? Um, and lastly, I just heard something that I felt was very disturbing by Miss O'Mara uh, with sea metals. Well, geez, if we give this to the uh, fire chief, or to the town engineer, they may want to change it, okay? So that raises some flags to me is that, well, maybe we'll just kind of scoot this under the table so that we don't have to go through all the motions. So I would like this project to have all the I's dotted and T's crossed. And compromise, yes, I agree with compromise. I'm very supportive of that, but only when everybody has an opportunity to, to have their opinions uh, told. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is uh, Jason Ames. I live on 1024 Sawyer Road, which is probably about 0.4 miles from the proposed development. And uh, just one point that's already been raised tonight, but um, <coughs> The traffic studies that have been done or haven't been done in terms of the impact on that road, which is heavily traveled by bicycle and pedestrians, um, probably as many people walk and bike that road as cars that go by, uh, especially in the summertime, is, is just the point that r regardless of what's measured with traffic study, I don't know if it's, if it's looked at the already compromised roads that are there during the process of the construction of some development, whether it's smaller or larger, the, the amount of heavy equipment on already compromised roads, uh, I think, poses a, a real potential danger for, for a child or a person, any person, uh, getting hit. Because it's one thing to have a small car driving down a, a bad road, but to have a uh, multiple ton vehicle going down full concrete. So I'm concerned about, if anything happens there, what the routes would be for the heavy equipment. Because they're bad roads already, uh, the drainage is bad, and I just think it's, it's possible uh, disaster for uh, for the kids, especially in the neighborhoods. That's a particular point I would raise. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Hi, uh, my name is Chris James. I live on 1008 Sawyer Road. I've lived there for 33 years. When I came here, I had no intention of saying anything, but having listened to all the um, adverse comments, I fully agree with all of them. And I just feel that this development does not fit. And I would like to describe it really as destructive to a neighborhood. I feel like a lot of other people that we all live around there, it is a country neighborhood. And this type of development is just not suitable, regardless of all the requirements, setbacks, wetlands, and everything else. It's, to me, it's just not suitable. Thank you. Thank you. If you would like to say anything, please come up to the podium. Otherwise, I'll close the public hearing. Is there anybody else? <coughs> I'm Barbara Wendell. I live 161 Mitchell. Um, I am for the development. And, and I really want to say that I was, um, and because I love the open space, I think it's a wonderful place for people like me who are over 55 who want to stay in Cape, I can't stay in this town um, with the property taxes being what they are, uh, having my home and facing retirement. And I thought this was a wonderful opportunity for people from Cape to be able to stay here. Um, I would drive very slowly on the road. I would. I would certainly go up Sawyer over to Fickett to go into South Portland. I would not drive around, you know, the sharp turn of Eastman. Um, I love the walking paths. I live on a, a house now that has several acres of open space and I, I care for it very much. And um, this will give me the opportunity to stay in the town, uh, afford the taxes, be able to retire here, contribute to the tax base, and, and stay in the town that I love. And I know there's quite a few others like myself who want to stay in Cape. When you look at the condos that are available for people like me, some of them are in Scarborough, South Portland, we're, we're going to have to move out of town. And many of us would like very much to stay here. Um, and I, I'm really hoping that the project can go forward, um, and I think, you know, taking care of the wetlands is very important, and I'm all for that, and, and it sounds like they're working very hard to, to observe that and the traffic condition, and, and hopefully you'll take that into consideration and, and help the project go through. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anybody else? Sure. Come on up and ask. Oh, did you speak already? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Seven, All right, go ahead. You have one question, though, since you spoke. Come on up to the podium, please. He, he didn't use his four minutes, though. He didn't use his four minutes. Okay, we'll let you use the rest of your four minutes. Yeah. My question is, and I'm not familiar with the process as much as I probably could be, but um, where there's been some modifications to the development that are going to be submitted, particularly regarding the wetland area, um, will, once that's submitted, will there be an opportunity for public hearing after that again? Yes, or there will be another public hearing for this. Okay. There is also the opportunity, and we've said this before, Please, if you have anything to say in between anything, send in your emails. They don't go unnoticed, believe me. We have a lot of reading to do. Yes, we have a lot of reading to do. Because we got quite a few um, of them. But send in emails. They're part of the public record. So when you don't have opportunities to speak, you can, you can write your feelings in or your ideas or your thoughts. And it, it comes to both every planning board member. Send them to Maureen O'Meara at the town hall. And it also goes to the applicants. As, so. as I understand it, Barbara, the applicant's asking uh, for two months. Yes, two months delay. To do some more engineering. Yes. So we, yes. And so we have. It, the applicant did not submit new plans even for the 
for the for this month's meeting. Right. The intent was always to take all the comments right. and go back and then resubmit. And they have now said that they, they don't want to come back in November. They want to take more time to do more of the work and they would like to be tabled to the December meeting. Right. So send in your comments and your thoughts. But is there anybody else? The hearing's still open. <coughs> you sure? All right, the public hearing is now closed. And I will open it up to the board. Would you please come back to the podium, Owens? And let's open up to the board and have some questions. Do I just hit that? Well, everybody's open. I don't have a specific question, but I, I didn't know if Owens wanted to respond to some of the concerns. You know, this, this is difficult for me because we will take some of the comments tonight, but we will see a full set of revised plans, Maureen, and please correct me if I'm wrong, probably in early December, so, which may address some of these issues, and then we're going to be re-reviewing those as well. <laughs> um, but, you know, at the Chair's discretion. No, but I, I think that perhaps some things we can make comments tonight because we have a lot of people Certainly. here who are interested, <laughs> and I think if we ask some questions yeah. and try to get some answers. Um, did you have a question or? Not specifically, other than. I had one. one. Educate me about the two different ways you're doing the sight lines. Sure, certainly. Um, the, the town's ordinance um, has a provision on road standards. And uh, within that ordinance, there's a table called the road classification table. And in that table, it speaks to the various classifications of roads, like collector roads, feeder roads, local streets, arterials, that sort of thing. And there's a table in there that uh, gives specifications for what site distance requirements you have to adhere to, okay? And uh, historically, uh, we have followed that table and used that table uh, to determine what the site distance is that we have to meet, okay? There is also another provision in the ordinance that talks about, um, and I think I have it here, so I want to make sure I, that talks about vehicle movements um, on what they call side road and commercial driveways. And uh, within that, it speaks to a more traditional site distance requirement uh, of a three and a half uh, foot I height looking at an object four and a quarter feet closer to like an MDOT standard. Actually, I think Paul knows this. I think the DOT went to, they, they actually lowered three and a half for the object height too. I think DOT made some changes, but site them. But um, so it, it's more of a traditional site distance measuring. And uh, historically, we've always applied those on commercial developments and major road connections, okay? And on other subdivisions that I've been involved with in this development, we've used the road classification table. Okay, and for the and in this particular instance, the peer review engineer uh, picked up on the side road and commercial driveway entrances and specified that site distance. Okay, we used a different measurement. Uh, Maureen, in her memorandum. Uh, indicated the town has applied both site distances in the past. Um, and I think, and beyond that, I, I spoke earlier about why I, my understanding on why the lesser site distance standard um, has been used historically uh, to try to promote a different type of design in the town. And with that, maybe Maureen could add on to that. She, I don't want to speak for her. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, let me just say that on the list of things that I'm hoping will be implemented from the new comprehensive plan, rewriting the subdivision ordinance is, is fondly high on my list because it is filled with a lot of stuff from the 1980s. And like any profession, planning has evolved since the 80s. Uh, one of the first things I worked on when I was hired was to, to redo the road standard, standards because um, we had what I would consider to be the state-of-the-art road standards and uh, a new subdivision was built in town and a, uh, a 
former councillor uh, Farmer characterized that road as a highway through the woods. So the bottom line was that the town really was not happy with the way these road standards are actually looked when they run on the ground. And um, I don't want to make this too long an explanation, but the, the, way I, the way it really has evolved in, if you go back to the 1950s in the Eisenhower administration and the national highway construction movement, we had these great national highway standards. And what happened is the standards for highways basically kept getting used on lower and lower uh, use roads so that we, we've ended up with road standards <coughs> that don't reflect neighborhoods. Uh, they're meant to be standards that very, very efficiently move cars as quickly as possible. So you end up with highways through the woods. And the planning board in the early 1990s was very unhappy with what they were getting for their road standards. Uh, we went through a process where they identified the roads in town which they liked, which they thought reflected a community character. And we went out there with the traffic engineer. We measured sight distance and horizontal and vertical curves and setbacks from roads and came up with a different approach. And I believe it's a, an approach that's very consistent with the new thinking which is that you really don't need to build really wide, flat, straight roads if you want to create a neighborhood. Those types of standards have a place in our national highway system, uh, not in our local road system. So that's why you have this, this road classification standards table, which really does the opposite of what you usually see. Instead of always pushing for more traveled way width, um, greater vertical and horizontal sight distance and actually gives a range and says we don't want you to go above <coughs> and the reason you do that is because if you include more hills in a road if you include more curves the one thing you do is you reduce the amount of grade changes you need to make in an existing landscape which reduces the amount of vegetation that has to be removed the other thing it does is, and there are studies that show this, that if you have a road that isn't as straight and isn't as flat and is a little more curvy, it forces drivers to drive more slowly. So our road standards actually reflect that new thinking. And the, the sight distance standard that our peer traffic engineer used is in the ordinance, but we haven't used that for residential construction for some time. We've left it in the ordinance because it says commercial driveways. And we haven't really rewritten standards for commercial driveways. If you read the standard in the ordinance, it says A, uh, roads, road classification, road classification standards, sta table standards. B, side roads and commercial driveways. And it has the old three and a half feet high measures of speed and, and how what kind of sight distance you can use. Because it's in the ordinance, I think the board can use the standard if you want to. But it's not the standard we've used because it doesn't reflect that neighborhood character. <coughs> there is more information I could provide. You. There was a ton of work that the planning board did on this when they when they created that table. We actually have been taking the court on the table and uh, using those standards as opposed to the more traditional ones, and we survived the court challenge. So I'd be happy to provide more information if the board needs it. Any questions? I have some more questions related to the site distances. Um, Owens, uh, in your report, the traffic report, um, part of your application, you identify on the western entrance the site distance being 230 feet looking to the right. Can you explain to me um, how you came up with that uh, distance? Um. Our uh, traffic engineer, uh, John Adams, actually measured that distance in the field. And um, he went out into the... Oops. I didn't pocket it there. <laughs> <laughs> I got mine. Mine's blue, mine's green. Oh, there it is. Um, I'm going to leave her there because I don't want to be accused of walking off. <laughs> um, when he went out into the field, um, he went to this location here, went to the edge of the travel lane, uh, went back 10 feet off the edge of the travel lane, and measured the sight distance looking this way to the, into the center of the lane for the oncoming traffic and then wheeled off that sight lane distance. 
and he did the same thing in the other direction uh, using uh, an eye height of three and a half feet and an object height of four and a quarter feet approaching. So he measured it in both entrances uh, to come at the site distance. Okay, now will the proposed um, western entrance say um, uh, the first 20 feet back off of Eastman Road be higher or lower than the existing gravel uh, path? Okay. Um, I believe the road climbs coming in and I have a reduced site site plan somewhere in here. I will consult make sure I answer that correctly. Yeah, I looked at the profile and it was just hard to... Uh, on Caninger Lane, uh, actually the first hundred feet of the road um, has a... Um, this is slightly higher, about six inches higher. Uh, at station zero plus 50, which is 50 feet in from the right away, for uh, other folks, it's, uh, the existing grade is an elevation of 78.9, and the proposed grade is 79.52, so it's about a half, a little more than half a foot higher. And at uh, the shoulder of the road, uh, it's about also about a half a foot higher uh, than what's out there now. The road takes a little, when you come off the edge of the pavement, there's a, a flat area and a slight dip, and then it starts to climb up as it comes into the site. So we're matching in at the pavement and 10, 15 feet back, we're probably about six to eight inches higher. Okay, well, um, I was not able to make the, um, the site walk, okay. nor the alternative site walk, or the alternate site walk, <laughs> but I was there this morning. Medium. Uh, yeah, I was there this morning and drove around um, and parked my vehicle on the western entrance looking, pointing you know, towards Eastman Road. Western entrance, okay. And uh, I just don't see how you can see 230 feet looking right with the bump in the road, the hill there. And well, Scott, I, I agree because that's why I started this line of questioning. When I was there on the alternate sidewalk, I looked right and... Wow, I hope nobody's coming over the edge. I mean, if it's 100 feet, I'd be surprised. Yeah. So I'd like, uh, I don't know how we request this, Maureen, but I'd like some sort of... Um, Do you peer review? Back, or? Peer, well, we've got a peer review, but some sort of back, back up or supporting documentation to show that 230 feet actually does exist. Well, actually, I met with Maureen today, and we've actually drawn a profile. Uh, we've surveyed Eastman Road. And I can provide you with a site distance plan that has an actual profile from our entrance, our finished grade, looking westerly and looking easterly exactly along that road. And we can, we can, we can provide that. Or we could, we've, take, we've gone out in the field before with Bob Malley or Steve and measured that, it. That's what I was going to, I don't know if the board wants to see it or if they're willing to delegate that to the town engineer or the public works director. but. I can arrange to have someone with me go out there and meet Owens out there and he can do the measurement and they can stand there and, and determine whether or not he has accurately measured it. All right, well, I, I'd volunteer for that because <laughs> I, I just can't see it. I just, yeah, me, me, I just me too. It's the it. first thing I thought of. I wasn't even thinking about it. Then I learned right to turn out of the driveway. It's like, man. Um, it, it bothered me. We can schedule. We can schedule something now where, when you're sure. available, when you can go out there and, and we can measure this. Paul, I can make. You know, you depends what it is. I'll try and, you know, a be lot there. Of, yeah. A, a lot of times, what we run into is the um, perception that if I can't see the road, then that's my limit of my sight distance. I mean, again, keeping in mind that. What you're looking for is a vehicle approaching you, and that vehicle is going to have a certain height. I don't disagree with you, Scott. I mean, what the first thing I noticed on the site walk was, wow, that, that's, you know, that's, that's kind of close. I, I've looked at the profile that's been provided. 
Um, I think it would probably help the board in terms just of an exercise of, of seeing this and, and validating this. But generally, the, the, the misperception is where I see the pavement then is the end of my sight distance, and that's not true. You're, you're actually thinking about if a vehicle is there, how far back can I see it? So yeah. again, just thinking of it from that perspective certainly adds distance. But uh, again, I encourage the board, if there's any question in your mind, to go through and, and, and go through that exercise of understanding how sight distance is, is determined because I think it helps everybody understand and feel comfortable with whether or not there is adequate sight distance. Maureen, yeah, I, I like that. And, and Maureen, your earlier discussion about the um, road standard for more local roads, is it is it one of those goals to have a shorter sight distance so people will go slower or I mean and it I know it sounds <laughs> counterintuitive but the whole idea of of not having a very wide space if you've got stuff on the side of the road we call it psycho perceptual impact it causes people to slow down um, the same thing with if you can't see as far ahead as you normally would um, your your tendency is to drive slower and, and and that's you know some people are reckless drivers and they go way too fast period uh, but if you think of and, and people who do that if the road's wider and has less of that impact I think it's they're, worse they're, it's much worse yes so yes it, I can understand that and, and, and I'll just I'll comment on that because obviously speeding on local roads is an issue that every community faces mm. Uh, and like with anything, it has to be a balance. Um, so, you know, Owens, what I would encourage you to do as you look at this is, and Maureen is correct from the standpoint that narrower roadways, roadways that are tree-lined, roadways that have, you know, less wide open space, more the more, uh, are going to have an effect on people driving slower. Uh, do I, you know, do I acknowledge that people on Eastman and many other roads in the town, do they drive faster than the post speed limit? Sure they do. I sat there on the site distance that day and watched people on the site walk that day and watched people drive by. I wouldn't be so all surprised that the average speed on Eastman is probably five to seven miles an hour over the posted speed limit. And that's relatively significant in my business. Uh, so that has to be factored into the, the design because you have to. We run into many cases where people say, well, the posted speed limit is 30, therefore the site distance requirements are X. You can't just take it literally. You have to openly acknowledge what is really occurring. So it's a balance. I, I encourage the applicant to try to find ways without reducing the character of the road, <laughs> certainly without, reduce, without cutting into the curvature of the roadway, but to you know, look to find ways to maximize sight distance while retaining roadway character. Um, so again, I, I think that's an opportunity that should be looked at. OK, so Maureen, you'll try to set something up. Um, well, I, I'm, is that something that you want to be at or you want the town engineer to be at? Because if you want to be at, we need to like get together before you leave tonight. Well, I, I'd like to be at that. And you would I would like to be at that. All right, so I'm going to try to schedule some time and I'll contact you, Owens. That would be fine. Yeah, can you just let the rest of us I, know? I'll email the whole board and, and okay. I will post it on the <clears throat> website if any members of the public want to attend as well. Absolutely. Thank you. <coughs> I have a whole list of things, but <laughs> I'm shocked. I'm waiting for everybody else. <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> um, an awful lot of the discussion and, and questions and comments by the public have on the um, question of, of wetlands. And um, I know from reading all the material myself, and I have read everything that you've said, in. thank you very much. Um, it certainly introduced some questions in my mind. Um, I think there were a lot of open questions about wetlands and whether they exist here, whether they don't exist there, what their impact is. I think there were maybe a few misunderstandings about the ponds there, which are irrigation ponds, not rental ponds. But I think we're coming close to winter. And I just wonder whether it's time for us to seriously consider an independent assessment of the wetlands before winter makes it impossible to do that. I was going to suggest that too, except that you've already had we've somebody come out. I would like to see a report from them, though. We, we will be providing getting that. I mean, the site walk was just on Monday. Right. So Did they actually look at, you know, like there's this one finger that you can have a hundred foot setback, 
if it's less than 100 feet and extends for, I forgot how many feet it is, 100 feet, um, did they actually look at that too? Well, let, me, let me sort of expand upon that. And I may get Mark to come up here in a moment since he was at the site walk. But uh, when the Army Corps and DEP were on site, we, the Army Corps wrote the wetland delineation manual. So we figured let's go right to the guy. Good. I'm Corps glad you did. That wrote that manual. <coughs> that are the ultimate authority. If we hired a peer review to come down and review the wetland delineation, we would probably end up going to the Army Corps anyway to, to make the final determination. So we said, you know, let's make this simple, let's be proactive, and let's call the guys that make the final decision. So we went right to the Army Corps. And on top of that, we didn't just invite the Army Corps down, we talked to Bob Green at the DEP and asked the DEP to come out. Which is great. So we, we, we just said, let's, you know, we knew there were probably people who were going to raise questions about it, so we said, let's just bring them out and look at it. And they, they did a couple of things. One, they spent over two hours on the site. So they looked at the stream question, which came up, and Bob Green uh, provided uh, a determination that it wasn't a stream, and we'll follow up with Bob to get something in writing. There just wasn't enough time between yesterday and today to get that. And then the other thing that happened was the Army Corps and Bob, we walked, they walked the property and they looked at the delineation of the wetlands. And they provided an assessment that was agreeable to those wetlands, uh, we, with the exception that they spent um, quite a bit of time looking at this area and through here. I've, I've actually personally had some experience with old agricultural fields. And I've had, uh, I had a, a project where there was wetland grow, growing up on the agricultural field, and there was a determination it wasn't a wetland because when they tilled it, they tilled the, the soil horizons up. And this was on a site in Gorm that the state was brought down to look at. So it, it, there's always that question. So they spent a lot of time looking at that. And after discussing it, they decided that they would in, um, call it a wetland. And, and we're being forthright with you that they called it a wetland. Um, we're trying to be very proactive here. And, and that will be shown up on the plan. It's going to be field located and will be shown on the plan. The other thing uh, that the, the Army Corps and the DEP uh, doesn't look at the wetlands from an RP1 or an RP2 wetland. Okay, that is a town of Cape Elizabeth specific requirement. So if you're asking did the Army Corps of Engineers you know, look at the delineation between an RP1 and an RP2 wetland, they don't, they don't look at that. They look at the actual delineation of, of a wetland. A wetland is a wetland in their view, so they do look at that. Um, so, uh, but they spent quite a bit of time on the site. And Mark, do you have anything to add to that? Is that fairly reflective of what happened out there? Okay. So, Did they look at this section over here, though, Mark? You know, where you have the wider part of the RP1 and then, the, then a strip in the middle and then the narrower part of the RP1, what we call RP1. My name's Mark Hampton. I'm uh, uh, a wetland scientist, a, soil, a certified soil scientist, and a site evaluator. Um, I've worked in the industry for uh, almost 20 years, uh, 10 years with Sebago Technics, and uh, nine years on my own. Um, the site walk that occurred yesterday, um, we, the intent was to look at the wetland delineation. Again, as Owen said, we didn't look at the distinction between the RP1 and the RP2. Uh, we looked at the wetland upland boundaries around the entire site, both on the eastern side and on the western side of the property, um, as well as anything that was in, in, within uh, the tree line as well. Um, so, again. Can they talk, can you ask them to talk a little bit about that part on the, on the western side when they write a letter or whatever they're going to write to you? Well, again, the letter that, we'll, that, that the Army Corps of Engineers will generate a letter for us that based upon um, our site walk, what modifications we will make to the plan, they will review and, and they will write us a letter back saying based upon the site walk and the modifications we made, they agree to the wetland delineation as shown onto a plan that we well, give of a certain date. Essentially, then they're saying... They're going to agree to the wetland delineation, but I want to make sure that you understand that right. They're not going to make a distinction between... No, I understand they're not going to make a distinction okay. between RP1 and RP2, but have they, are they going to talk about the delineation of those two areas on the western side? They will not make a distinction between the delineation of those two areas. They won't show them? In other words... The, the plan will... I'm sorry. The plan will show them. That's but, all I'm asking. I'm 
I'm not asking whether they're going to show them as RP1 or RP2. Yeah, the plan that we send to them. The outlines of them confirming that your plan is accurate in terms of how they've been mapped on your plan. Is that clear or unclear? It's a little unclear. I think all they're going to look at is the upland edge, the furthest upland edge of the wet area. They're not going to, in order, I know the area you're talking about is that northern section. Because there are quite a few questions. There are some questions. Well, but the, the, but the, the questions are surrounding the town of Cape Elizabeth delineation of wetland regulations. They're not covering <coughs> what the state or the federal government look at. For them, it's either wetland or not wetland. Whereas in Cape Elizabeth, okay, never mind. we require <laughs> okay. Mr. Hampton to wade into the wetland and find the place where RP1 One converts RP2. to RP2. So that whole area is just going to be shown as, as far as, as far as they're concerned, it's all wet. Okay. I have a follow-up question then, uh, Mark. How, how, roughly how much uh, square footage um, of this, this um, I guess, wetland that was missed is now there? You know, in that center part of the... Phase three, two. How, how big is right. that area? Well, we don't we don't know exactly yet. But roughly, approximately, yeah. some place in the order of about uh, eight to ten thousand square feet. Eight to ten thousand square feet. So, yeah. an area of 100 probably a hundred by hundred. Hundred by hundred. And was there any discussion about whether or not it had been filled rec uh, recently or not filled or it is what it is or? The discussion we, the discussion was brought up because we because Bob Green being with DEP was aware of Chris Popey being out on site uh, on, an, on an enforcement call. Um, it was very clear on site to both the Corps and DEP based upon the vegetation that's there, um, even though it had been uh, uh, mowed, that uh, there was no evidence that, that any filling had been taking place on that site other than there was an obvious area where a test bit had been dug. Okay. Uh, but there had been no filling or disturbance otherwise that uh, disturbed the vegetation that didn't allow it to, to grow back in any unusual uh, form. The area itself, historically, I mean, we can get into you know, what we spent a lot of time on briefly, is that this area was, was curious to all of us in the fact that historically it was developed as a result of the agricultural practices on the property. And that it was an area that um, on one side, there had been some kind of either a farm road or a berm that had been created that had actually ponded or, or, or collected water in that area. Um, but then, um, at some later date, that, that road had been breached to allow this area to drain off. There were actually um, some old dug ditches that were also in there to try to, to you know, again, attempt to, to deal with this area, again, historically long ago, like we're, we're talking 80 to 100 years ago, there, in some of these ditches there are red oaks now growing that are three feet in diameter. So, so this is something that was, that was curious that, you know, the watershed area was very small. Um, the, both the DEP and the Corps were looking at that. Um, it turns out it's just a depressional area that the watershed itself is just within a two or three acre site uh, immediately surrounding it. Um, uh, the Corps was looking around for, he, he thought there had to be some kind of, of diversion or service swale that, that came into this area, um, and, and he couldn't find it. Um, so, so that's what we were looking at. Well, and my final question on the wetlands is, is there, is there wetlands on the Sprague property? That, there are, yes. That have not been shown on the map? No. There was an area of, of, of wetlands on, um, at the far end of the Sprague parcel that once I'm out on the site, I don't always know exactly where I am. You know, whether I'm on the parcel or on somebody else's property, I know I'm, I'm close. And there was an area of wetlands that I did flag and did locate. However, then bringing it back into the office um, and putting it onto a plan, um, uh, we found that it actually wasn't even on the spray parcel. Okay. Of course, I have to remind everybody that portion is not going to be developed at all. We have to so it's probably somewhat irrelevant if there's a small part piece of wetland at the far end of the spray. We had this discussion at the workshop as to whether they needed to do that, and we decided because it was so far. Well, but it was also it's also off, undeveloped off land, and if there's a small piece on the end of it, I don't. No, think that unless matters. it impacts setbacks, which apparently it doesn't. No. Right. Um, 
there were there were a number of questions about that section over here, though. And, and I just reread your letter, saying, but you actually went out there with GPS and. We went beyond um, GPS, as we all know, is great for. Uh, it's a certain level of accuracy that sometimes is good and sometimes isn't so good. Um, and, and in this case, uh, it was initially located with GPS. <laughs> However, because we knew of, of the issue with you know, determining where the RP1 uh, setback would be located, all my wetland flags were survey located by Sebago Technics so that they were very accurately located for us to be able to make the determination of you know, what RP1 was sufficiently large enough in order to require the proper setbacks. And all that was flagged, that long skinny piece. Everything, yes. Yeah, everything out there was flagged, and it was flagged, labeled RP1, RP2, the different lines. And, then, and all those flags were all survey located. <coughs> More questions about the wetlands? And, um, all right, I do think we need the confirmation as you're going to provide it from the Army Corps of Engineers. And, is DEP writing a report too? Um, I'm sure we can ask them to provide, a, a, you know, a statement or a letter on that. I think that would be useful. Yep. And and you're also going to provide Owens the copy of the the non NOV. Is that what you called it? <clears throat> yeah, I, Joel actually provided me with a copy of it tonight. And it's a it's a form. DEP. I'll provide your folks with a copy. As Joel actually ended up talking to Chris Kofi, but what happens is when the DEP makes a site visit, they fill out a form like this when they get back to the office that says uh, the, the alleged violator, uh, the location, uh, who the staff person was, the date initiated, last date of the activity, and down here um, it says no violation. Okay. It gives the date, so we'll provide that uh, to the copy to the town. Other questions? I have some other questions, but other questions? I have some other questions? Okay. I've heard the explanation of why you don't want to make this a 55 and over complex. And yet you're striving hard to make it for people 55 and older. I'm going to throw out an opposite argument to you just to think about. There are some people. I'm not one of them, I'm over 55, but I'm not one of them, who don't really want to live around children. And you might end up attracting a greater number of people if you actually have deed restrictions that state either adults only, if you want to have younger adults too, but they'd have to move out if they had children, you know, no children over two or whatever, and over 55. Or, I mean, you could just have deed restrictions, and I'd really think seriously about it, because there isn't another complex like that in Cape Elizabeth. And that would certainly mitigate stress on our tax system. Um, and I'd also think real hard about the outside of your units. And I know we don't have design standards, but I urge you to really think hard about them. Um, I had heard you were going to make them all one color. I think really seriously about that. And the exterior, I know you have to keep costs at a reasonable level and you can't do all kinds of things. But just kind of think about how you can dress, and one person did talk about that here, but how you might be able, was my reaction, to really dress them up. Because I think it could be smashing without having a whole lot of extra expense. And you're very creative, so. You know, we need to think about those kinds of things. Um, the community impact statement. <laughs> if it's not going to be an adult only or 55 year over, older, I don't think it's accurate, the community impact statement. I don't know about anybody else, but it was just geared to the same numbers. I mean, maybe it won't be all adults. And I know that they're two bedroom units, and that's going to attract older people or perhaps some younger single people, and not single, but younger couples. Um, but I think you have to think about the community impact statement. It was really just the same thing all over again. At least that's how I found it. So you might want to 
stew on that. I don't know if anybody else found that or not. <coughs> I, would, I would tend to agree with you. I think unless you specifically exclude children, phase one is going to start at 350. It's going to be a very attractive situation for some families with young children of modest incomes, maybe families with handicapped children who want single level living, things like that. I don't think there's any way that's going to be unattractive to young families. I, I, I certainly appreciate that, and Joel and I will talk about that. Um, I, I know that I have been involved with a very large southern Maine developer who's developed over 500 condominium uh, units throughout southern Maine. And one of them is a project of over 250 in Kennebunk on one development. And what they have found is, um, and they, they target the over 55 group, and, uh, but they haven't um, deed restricted all of their developments. They, in some cases they have some, but most of the time they don't. And what they have found is that, um, actually I talked to him today, that he said less than 5% um, had uh, any kids in their developments. And um, he told me one story of one case that it was a grandparent who, was, who had a child that would, that, um, not the grandparent didn't have the child, but they were taking care of the child for whatever reason. And uh, so, you know, I, I, well, Joel and I will talk about some options there, but I just think about it as, yeah, as some certainly you know, If there was that grandparent that was living in the condo and something happened to uh, uh, their, uh, their child and they ended up having to take care of a child for a while, I mean, we certainly wouldn't want, you know, who knows, maybe the parents, something terrible happened and they ended up with the child. I mean, there's can be these anomalies that happen. But even the quote, over 55 units, allow for that. I mean, even under the federal guidelines, when you put that restriction in deed when you have scenarios like you have or there are certain floors you can have five or ten percent and not quote violate the restrictive covenants uh, in voluntary situations like that um, so I mean I'm I I think it's up to the developer I don't well I do too but I, I and, and I don't I, I do see the need uh, I do see the potential for the enhanced marketing effort, but my view is that's a private decision and the developer has to decide one way or the other. I certainly do see the need in the town for it. I'm just saying think about it. I, I agree, but what I'm suggesting to the developer is even if you decide to go that route, it's not like you've completely ruled out, you know, children in the complex completely because of those unusual situations, but worth looking into. Okay. Uh, but Fair enough. Thank you. Um, would you consider maybe some stop signs at the end of the development before you get to Eastman Road? Stop signs uh, on know, our roads that we're constructing? Yeah. I, I let the, Maureen, do I have to the power back? <laughs> no, you know, just right at the end where you get to Eastman oh, Road? Oh, yes. Oh, there will have to be stop signs. Oh, okay. Yeah, That's Bob fine. Malley won't that let me get away that. with that. Because <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be a combination stop sign, street sign. Okay. And there will also be one at, 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 at the loop on TVs. Oh. There will be a stop sign there, too. Um, Maureen, I have a question for you, for people who are left. What, what was the discussion about, there were several emails about um, supposedly putting in two foot, um, I forgot what you call them now, somebody help me, on Eastman Road, you know, pardon? Speed tables? Speed tables. Not speed tables. Um, sides of the road. Sidewalks. Not sidewalks. Um, shoulders. Shoulders. What was that? Was there any discussion about shoulders on Eastman or not? I don't think there's been, I haven't seen anyone who's requested a shoulder on Eastman Road. What I've seen is a request for sidewalks. Right. Okay. Well, how, what is the town's position or Eastman's not on the well, plan for that because it isn't that I mean, I, I, if there's anyone that's in any doubt about my great love for sidewalks, let me correct them right now. <laughs> I'm a big sidewalk fan. Uh, but the reality there's is... There's one in front of the Kelt building. You know, yeah, you got it. All right. <laughs> Thank you. And, you know, all the new projects I have sidewalks. The challenge is, and I, I'm speaking from the Pedals and Pedestrians Committee from the 1990s, uh, I've been working with the Road Safety Working Group, which has just been appointed by the Town Council, and they are very aggressively pursuing in installing some new pedestrian facilities in the town. And the reality is there's huge questions about cost 
and who's going to pay for these and who's going to maintain them after they're installed. And the real struggle is if we can't get them in the places where we already have a great amount of the population living, like Shore Road and Mitchell Road, um, it, you really have to beg the question of should they be on Eastman Road, where right now, even with this project, right. there's very low population. So I'm not saying that the planning board shouldn't have a sidewalk. But the Road Safety Working Group is saying Shore Road, Mitchell <laughs> Road, and, and yeah, you start. The, I mean, you start in the places where you have the greatest number of people living right now, where you already have a, a, a demand and conflict with a high amount of, of uh, vehicles and people on bikes and, and on foot sharing the safe pavement. So that's where the comment came from my memo. Not that it was no sidewalk, but you know, if you're looking from a town-wide policy, this one isn't on the list yet. OK, anybody have any other questions right now for, yes, Paul? Oh, ones I couldn't read the last name on the, on the community impact analysis. Who prepared the report? Oh, that's Lee J. Feldman. Lee J. He's our planner. Oh, does anybody want to do anything about that? Because as, as things stand now, I don't think that the, the analysis was really a whole lot different in the second one than the first one. Or what we did in the second one was there was... Uh, there were two tables, tables yeah, that were added. Were tables added, uh, which was requested to, so that you could do a comparative analysis to, you know, on the development. So uh, and then it was put together in the phasing part of it. Is there's, if there is something else that the board feels they'd like to add to that, I mean, we can certainly do that. Um, in, you know, with the percentages that we're projecting for uh, the 55 and older, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, it, it's, the analysis is what we would expect just because, uh, let's face it, the, you know, the school systems probably take the biggest hit uh, for, on the tax basis. So that's why that shows, you know, that actually this project results in a net increase in tax revenue to the town. Anybody have any particular question or problem with that or not at all? <coughs> Anybody have anything else? Well, one of the points that I think it was Mr. Plimpton's letter, and I just I think this is more of a double check item, is the density and open space calculations, Maureen. He went through a and I literally got this at four o'clock this afternoon. So I'm frantically reading it. <laughs> <laughs> this evening, but I do want to put it on the table just to, to since we are going to be looking at a two month extension. Uh, it's probably uh, fair to the, Mr. Plimpton and the other folks who sort of signed on to the, his letter uh, to run through those calculations against what he did so that we can sort of see maybe we made a mistake, maybe the developer did, maybe that just some of the assumptions may be uh, not 100% right on, <coughs> but I think that's a fair request. I think part of that was related to the, uh, the Sprague properties and the, right. and the buffer around the wetlands there, right? How much that would reduce the... But, but the buffer doesn't reduce. It does, it does not. It does, it does not. not reduce. Right. It's not. And I, I, I didn't get a chance to pull it out, but there is a memo that I wrote to the board when they calculated the cross-hill density calculation, okay. and I can get that to you. And, um, if Meaning decided, how the methodology. Yes, yeah. yes. And if you've decided you want to do it differently, that's fine. But using that methodology, which the board approved at that time, um, you deduct RP1 wetlands. Right. You do not deduct RP2 wetlands. Right. You do not deduct RP1 buffers. Um, you do deduct uh, the actual area of roads. Um, you deduct any existing easements and um, no isolated areas have been deducted as part of this project. In the past, the board has been extremely narrow in its interpretation of what really <coughs> is an isolated area. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd have trouble changing the rules because very recently a project was approved where the, which was much closer in terms of um, how much open usable open space there was mm -hmm. and this has a lot more usable open space right. i just don't think that no and i'm not asking barbara I'm, to do you're that just, I'm you're just, just I, saying check his numbers well and, and again I, I, I probably would have had a minute to do 
what Maureen was describing, but we, like I said, <coughs> we got a lot of these very late this afternoon, so I'm actually glad to hear we're going to have a little bit more time to review some of this. One thing I, I like you said, I got it at 4 o'clock. All I had time to do was hit print <laughs> and do some other things and get here, so I, I really don't know what else uh, could you just peer email. at those when you're going we will, discussing but, and going through them? I mean, I, your calculations are very clear right here on the front page. I think Second. as I read that memo, what was being challenged was the methodology used to calculate the net density. In okay. other words, right. this right. memo is saying you should deduct RP2 weapons. You should, de I, I, as I read it, should deduct the buffers. Right. You should deduct the things that the town But that's not required in our right. code. So, so well, what no, we are doing... Yeah. It's not required in the way we've interpreted it in other situations in the past, right. including Cross Hill and including the most recent project, yeah. formerly we, known as Sproing Point. We strive to be very consistent with how we've calculated them on past projects and follow that methodology. That sure. We use. Anybody have anything else? Oh, I have one other question. That is when you're talking about things, um, there was a recommendation made in the traffic um, review, mm -hmm. your review, that talked about placing money in escrow for tra any traffic calming that would need to be done after the fact. And it might be prudent for us, it would be prudent for us, to talk about you know, what amount that might involve to be put so that it's completely up front. <coughs> I mean, I don't have any clue. I th but think this road only qualifies for passive measures, if I, re I remember seeing Correct. that somewhere. But it did make the recommendation that some money no. would be active. Yeah, I think we, I think there was an error, and I know I made the error earlier, that Eastman Road is classified as a rural connector. In fact, Eastman Road is classified as a feeder road. Oh. And a feeder road is eligible for the active traffic control measures, not just the passive ones. Your sight lines go down then. That's right. So uh, just, okay, just again to clarify, so in your report to us, talks about the classification standards table to comply with, comply with site distance requirements of 200 to 250 feet. Is that incorrect? And it should be 100 to 150 to 200 feet? Just seeing if we're reading it, right? Well, <laughs> it was when I got to the other standard that I checked it and figured out that I okay. read classified. Okay, so so if it is oh. a feeder, then it would be it would be eligible for active. It would be, yes. Okay. Okay, so I think that needs to be part of our discussion because there's always that problem. If there's a problem afterwards, and everybody's gone, then you know what do you do about it? But if you have to put some money up for it. And you're going to be there because you're going to want that money if there's nothing wrong. Yeah, so. I would, I guess, you know, uh, Joel and I have talked about this. And, um, you know, <coughs> this project is very expensive uh, to develop. That's just the know. reality of it. Uh, we're running about 2,000 feet of sewer down Eastman Road, uh, which is not cheap because we're going to be going through some ledge down through there. We're going to extend the piece of water main, we're going to build a pump station on the property. Um, you know, it, it is, it, when you start looking at the cumulative cost, and on top of that, five, uh, uh, we have to have five total affordable houses or uh, condominiums as part of the project, which is fine. It's a note right on the plan. We're going to do it as part of the phasing. But that is not, there's no revenue from those that comes in to the developer. That is an, as a cash payout to build those units. The developer makes no money at all. It's actually, it's a loss. So he has to make up that money in the other unit. So, you know, the numbers have, and Joel is, I know because he's talked to me a number of times, he's very concerned about the costs and, you know, has, and I think he's been pretty honest with the board. It said that he had wavered at one point whether to go back to a traditional subdivision or stay with a condominium. And part of, a lot of that is to do with cost. But what I'm saying is, is that it would be nice if, yeah, you know, we, it's, it would, it's important to the developer to understand what that active improvements would be, what those costs might be, because are, are they, are they $5,000 worth improvements, are they 2500 or are they $100,000? So I said I don't have any idea. And, and that's a decision that we would like to 
get to sooner than later because um, you know if it starts those numbers start to creep up the developer has a business decision to make on, on, on how all of that 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 plays into it so I, I guess what we would ask is that um, you know and as I read it too if, if we part of the concern I thought around the traffic coming was is that if we were at the you know and Tom had indicated that you know what happens if it was all families living in there you know that that puts us into a different category the condominiums that generates higher traffic and I don't understand I wasn't sure if what he was getting at is, is we should go all the way to the other side and err on the extreme side of caution and, and figure that it's all going to be built out as traditional condominiums and that would require all this traffic coming. So I, I, I guess you know where we're going is we would like to have work with the board to have a better understanding of what that means, what that contribution might be. And I, I don't know how would, I guess what's the best way to get at that because Joel's going to say he can't have an open. <laughs> he's he's got to deal in as much knowns as he can. Oh, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at it. <laughs> you do this for a living, Paul. <laughs> uh, I think there are a fair number of active measures that could be, you know, in a reasonable cost range if that is so deemed appropriate for the road and by the by the residents of the area. Um, similar to what we did with Spurwink Woods, there was a lot of input from the public as to what they really wanted. And I think we need to get some more of that this time around as well to just try to get a sense as to what people would want to do. And you're talking about traffic calming measures, not sidewalks, oh, although that's a safety issue. Well, unless the town is willing to well, put in sidewalks, it becomes really I, difficult. Right. I, guess well, I, I, mean, I mean, all by itself, Eastman Road is a... <laughs> Is a is a traffic calming measure. I mean, <laughs> are, are there additional things that could be done? Sure. Um, you know, would they have a positive benefit to 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 speed and safety? Maybe. Um, you know, we're actually finding studies now that speed tables and speed humps are a detriment because people speed up before and people speed up after, uh, and that your 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 area of benefit is extremely lo is extremely localized. Right on the belt. Um, you know, I think maintaining the rural character of Eastman Road is probably your best bet to, you know, to, to, to controlling speed. Um, so I, could there, are there cost effective things that could be done? Yes. No, I guess my question is, we have the peer review that made that recommendation, yes. and we have Sebago Technics expert that didn't have that in it, and we have to make a decision, is that a good recommendation or a bad one? Well, I think the developers, you as the expert. the developers fair request is give me an idea now because no no I, I understand I have some that decisions to make business wise but yeah. part go ahead no you guys I, I don't know I mean the, the, the difference in traffic between what John has put you know John has 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 put forward versus what Tom has, has indicated isn't noticeable to the normal person or even noticeable to people You'd, ha you'd have to measure it in order to understand the difference. Um, you know, and is that difference enough to say, yes, a traffic calming measure, measure or no a traffic calming measure? The answer is no. You know, you, we either think that traffic calming measures on Eastman Road are a, a good idea, yes or, or no. Whether or not you add this development isn't really going to have a significant impact upon Eastman Road, in my professional opinion. Uh, your professional opinion is yep. very valuable. So, um, so a again, in that regard, does Eastman Road probably exhibit traffic traveling too fast? Yeah, probably similar to most other roads in, 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 the, in the town. Uh, could it be a candidate for some traffic calming applications? Sure. Uh, could we ask this developer to do it? Sure. Um, you know, I, again, but I, you know, in, in terms of the, of the burden, you know, this isn't, this isn't adding any type of you know, overburden on, on, on Eastman Road over what it's doing today, so. Just the specifics at this point are too. And I'm, Paul, I'm, not, I'm just saying, no, I, I just, we have to leave that open right now. I'm comfortable with that. You know, we have asked applicants to do things in the past they're, because they're here and they're in front of us. <laughs> you know, and, is, and, 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 and is this an opportunity to address an issue? Certainly. Yeah. Is it within our, our, our realm of opportunity? Absolutely. So, you know, I, I like the suggestion of Tom to, as a follow-up, 
determine is there really a problem or not. We all have our perceptions, but I think getting some after-the-fact information would sure. really help us understand whether or not. And I think if the applicant would like to be better informed as to what they are <coughs> responsible to, we could probably put our heads together and say, you know, given the current guidelines, here's some things that we would want to put in our toolkit as, as options to consider. Would it make, um, I, would it make sense uh, for us to um, get back together with staff? I guess, you know, uh, any traffic commenting that would be done or any amount of potential options would probably have to be okayed by the town public works director, the town engineer, and maybe get back with Tom Errico um, to have a discussion about that. Because, frankly, we, you know, I heard this conversation at sidewalks. There's like 2,000 feet of east road. No, I'm not. I'm, you know, I'm, that, would, that would just make the project go away. No, I understand. And, and, and I was actually on that issue thinking <laughs> the opposite. That I'm, based on what I'm seeing, that's not even on the table as far as I'm concerned. So, for what I'm seeing. So, go ahead. Would it be appropriate? We could get with Maureen, and I'm going to ask for her input here, too, uh, and then come back for a short um, pointed discussion on just that at the uh, November meeting. You, you can do it at a workshop if, if you're looking for a discussion rather than... Yeah, we'd like to try to strive for some sort of general consensus. Yes, yeah. and, and I'm thinking in terms of a list in, in ranks, both from the development yeah, side and I, the I mean, town I, I side. Think just from my perspective as a starting point, Owens, I think, you know, the area in and around the entranceways is certainly an area that may be appropriate to try to influence speed. Okay. Simply because we know we have areas that have uh, limited sight distance, albeit acceptable. Um, and so certainly defining a limited area in and around, you know, the, the, the entrances of, of, of the development would be, in my opinion, appropriate. You know, to extend this broadly, in my opinion, would not. So again, I think there's opportunity to do things well within reason, but certainly towards the focus of reducing speed, improving safety, and benefiting the development as well as you know travelers on Eastman Road. Fair enough. Well, <coughs> then, uh, could we strive to get on a workshop meeting then in November, and we'll meet with staff and other folks, and then try to. Um, mm. Because I, I, I can see this would be nice to resolve this before we get back in December. Because I could well, see I, that. You know, all he said in it was, you know, having money in escrow. So that's why I was throwing it out yeah. on the table. But maybe there's some things we can come up with. Yeah. These yeah. fairly simple things that would it's not be enough. too. Maybe it wouldn't put a great burden on the developer, or yep. and and maybe there's some other things that we can talk about at the workshop too that might make it easier in terms of your planning like you can maybe go over more carefully the wetlands and you know you can go back over that again and so we're absolutely sure everything is understood by us completely and fair enough so are we going to do that i think it's fair since we've opened the public hearing to let the public know they can come to the work they can come to the work send them a note yes right right yes okay. certainly be good yeah. and then we'd be back in december and there'd be another public hearing yeah. right but that might help in terms of your final no, plans. No public hearing in December. No, okay. okay. No in December? No, no, no. I, I, I believe I the applicant suggested there would be another public hearing in December. And I didn't know that, that was the intent of the board, to open the public hearing back up in December. Well, I, I guess... No, that was, a, yeah, that was a question we had, right? Well, I don't... Or regardless of, 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 of what the question is, my thought would be until I get a set of revised plans, Maureen, I, I'm not going to commit to say I don't want to reopen the public hearing or I want to leave it closed or I do want to open it. I mean, we, we've got a revised set coming in in December. And, you know, to, to preclude or not preclude public input on what are going to be some revisions based on what I think has been a clearly raised, fairly stated wetlands issue, which the developer concedes needs to be addressed in these new plans, I think would be unfair to just to shut the door on that. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you can't hold a public meeting right, in right. December. I'm saying that if you table this meeting tonight, right. you need to decide tonight whether mm -hmm. there's going to be a public hearing at the December meeting mm -hmm. or whether you're going to wait to see the revised purpose, plans. For notice purposes, because they can be submit, they would submit for... You, when you, you the, it is the planning board that has the authority to schedule public hearings. Right, right. So, and you need to do it at a public meeting so That's if he right. submits the plans December 1st for the December 18th meeting, 
you need to make a vote that says yes there will be a public hearing in December or just table to December and then that doesn't mean you couldn't decide to hold another public hearing but it wouldn't be at the December meeting you could table it to January well, for public hearing or, do you have to get the applicant you need, approval? You need to decide tonight whether you want approval? to have a public hearing in December. For notice purposes? Yes. OK. Wishes to the board. And I did. If it makes it easier, I just talk to Joel. I mean, we're, that's fine if you wanted to potentially have, if you wanted to schedule it as a public hearing in December. I just don't want the public thinking there's going to be one and show up here and find out there isn't one. There that's why I jumped on your. No, that's minute. fine. Yeah, we'll you know, that. given that this is a fairly <laughs> substantial project, I think it behooves us to go ahead and say there is going to be a public hearing in December unless other people disagree with me. No, I, I, to do that, do we have to table this until well, we're, we're, we're going to table it anyway. anyway. Yep. The only question, Jim, is are we in addition going to say to the public we're going to have another public hearing? Yep. Because of the timing of this, and actually in a way to keep it moving along, we're going to, we're going to say tonight we're going to have a public hearing uh, on the revised plans. I mean, my only concern with that is I don't want to reopen it up to all some of the issues we've covered tonight. I'm trying to narrow the issues and, you know, um, keep, to keep the project moving along one way or the other. Um, I seem to remember somewhere a discussion was that the applicant would need to say it's okay to table it. Just, or uh, yeah. For tonight, okay, you don't need the applicant's permission. Right. Okay. After I tonight, it has to be with the consent of the applicant. Because After of tonight. Because of our rules required. <laughs> Right. You have, you, have, you, have the you can table tonight because your rules allow it. After tonight, um, the next meeting you come to, it has to be tabled with the consent of the applicant. So, or you have to make a decision. And, and your inclination is to get on the November 6th workshop agenda to discuss the issue, those two issues that yep. we've identified so far. we may so even far. have a revised sketch plan for that night, so. It's three weeks away because of the way the Tuesdays fall, so there's actually a little but more we time. May, we, we don't have to pre-submit for the no. workshop, nope. right? So yeah, just bring that may work out fine for us. Um, so. so how does everybody feel about having another public hearing? I, I have a question. Um, if this matter goes beyond the calendar year, January, are we going to have significant turnover in the board that's going to influence how well the board can deal with this? I have no idea. Do you have any sense that of that? There's, there's no way I'm going to predict okay. that. <laughs> well, it still has to go to final subdivision review anyway, so it is going to go over into yeah. January. I, I can tell you that, you know, turnover on the board is a fact of life. Well, I can as, as you well know. I know. <laughs> I can tell you that the current chair came on the board in the middle of the Blueberry Ridge project. Mm -hmm. And the effort that is made is when a new board member comes on board. Um, you know, this is the record. They, they get up to speed. We have special site walks. Or they, they, they read minutes and they they make a, they make the effort that's needed to participate. How's your election fund, Jack? What does it look like? <laughs> no, it wasn't. It wasn't <laughs> just, <you know. laughs> To say, I'm ready to make a motion unless we have more dis substantive discussion. I, and I see Maureen raising her hand. I, I would concur with having and uh, scheduling another public hearing tonight. I just wanted to call to the board's attention <laughs> an item that the applicant has brought forward because I think they want some feedback on it. Uh, the fire chief has recommended. Oh, I'm back to the fire chief. Back to the fire chief. <laughs> the fire chief has recommended, and if you can use your pointer to help with this, that yes, the water line be in the the water, no, the water so line. The water line ends here. Word <laughs> here. Tanager Lane, up Eastman Road, all the way to Sawyer. Hello. And from, from, and where are you bringing it from now? Uh, it stops right here. And then we're going to. Existing the, now. Existing the now. water line. Water. And then we're going to extend it to this lower entrance so that we have the loop system through the development. And it will terminate at that location. And that was fire. the retest you had from We had a retest, that's correct. We went out and had a retest. It showed fire flows at 20 PSI of over 1,000 gallons per minute. I think it was 1,085. The original test, like I said, was a 1994 yeah. test. It was like 900 and, I don't know, 34, 35 gallons per minute. And so when we saw that, we said, geez, <laughs> it ought to be retested. So we contacted the water district, paid our fee, and they went out at 2 o'clock in the morning and did a two hydrant test and followed the NFPA protocol. The water district does it all the time, and, and so we got those revised results, and we'll make sure 
I thought I had actually provided them, but I guess I didn't, so I'll make sure I do. So how, how many extra feet is that? Well, the thing is, the applicant's going 2,300 feet in the other direction down Eastman Road for the sewer line. Right. So you would pretty much be opening up all of Eastman Road for this project. Oh, water one way, sewer the other way. Yeah. Something to be said about that. I can tell you that <laughs> extending the water line from here all the way down to Sawyer Street, water lines, you know, ductile iron water lines in ledge are very, very expensive. Yeah. And, um, and that letter has been received by the, the fire chief and it still doesn't think it's adequate. <laughs> just can't the, afford the fire it. Chief is a, the fire chief, you know, feels very strongly that any opportunity he has to improve the utility infrastructure and improve firefighter protection is an opportunity he needs to um, exploit to its greatest potential. So what, what, what is he asking for exactly? He, the water line? The standard apparently is 1,000 gallons right. a minute. Right. <laughs> they're just under that. No, they're no, no, over. over. They're over. over. The retest. The, they re do, do you right. have? Do you have a letter from Portland? Yeah, we do. We have their report. Actually, it's right. That Joel handed it to me tonight because it, it, they, as soon as we found out about this, we asked them to retest it, and we noticed that Dayton will provide that. It's flow available at uh, residual of 20 psi, 1,085 gallons okay. per minute. So right. it's the old one that was under. We'll provide they that. Test it was slightly under, and then retest it slightly over. I mean, I mean, anything you anything you say tonight is dependent upon the applicant actually submitting all this information. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> they have in front of them. Right, right. Well, we but, don't accept it if it's not in writing. But right. But they're going back to revise <laughs> the plans, and if you want to give them a direction at this time or not give them a direction at this time. But what, what do we have from the fire chief that says what he's looking for? We have a memo from the fire chief that says. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. in here. Okay. He's looking for 1,000 to 1,500, I believe. No, he's looking for, well, he's looking for <laughs> more water than he has now. And I thought it was less than 1,000. The standard that he referred to was 1,000 gallons. <coughs> the test has been done that shows that you're slightly above 1,000 gallons. That's fine. Okay, the memo from the fire chief. I reviewed this plan and met with the Portland Water District on several occasions on this project and offered the following information. Water mains on Eastman Road are marginally inadequate for residential development. The most recent test by the applicant, by, by the Portland Water District at the request of the applicant actually says they are marginally adequate. Um, they should be at least 1,000 gallons per minute. The applicant said 1,080. When you add more density to the project, you have more of a hazard and should increase your fire flow. In some cases, you might not be able to increase your flow because the water mains in the area might not be large enough to accomplish that. We have an old 8-inch main feeding from Spurwink Ave. By extending the main from that direction, it won't help the flow characteristics. If you look at the hydrants on Eastman Road and along Spurwink Ave in this vicinity, you will see an orange ring around these hydrants, indicating a flow of between 500 and 1,000 gallons per minute. I wonder what those meant. Now we know. I thought it was very, I asked him to Blue, I've seen blue ones too. If you see hydrants with a green ring, oh. that means of flows of 1,000 to 1,500 gallons per minute. If, you, if a hydrant has a blue ring, a blue ring. It, it means over 1,500 gallons. So those are the ones you want near your house. Those are the good ones. <laughs> My suggestion is as follows. We have a 30-inch main crossing Sawyer Road oh. in this area. We should bring the main back from this direction, making a loop system, thereby increasing the flow to the whole of Eastman Road and even positively impacting the flows on Spurwink Ave. I've heard that the Pudic is considering an expansion, and it would be a shame to miss out on this We'd opportunity love to have us do that road is dug up. I'm just truly not inclined to ask this developer to make a dent in that. I mean, that's a nice proposal to the town council, but I don't see it in this project. As long as we have information from a Understood. reliable source that the flow is adequate, I don't think we have any right to ask this developer either. Well, the flow is adequate before additional residence is built. And what happens after that? Well, it's, it's the service to the site that Correct. is what they're looking for. I mean, he, he's making sure he's got enough capacity there. But right. that memo just suggests to me he's looking for a little bit more for the town. And I don't given. I understand that. Uh, you I know what? Some of that with a grain of salt. Well, I understand. So. Unless the uh, town staff has any strong feelings. I'm concerned about having to rip up the entire. Well, that's process. another issue. I couldn't hear you, Maureen. Rip I'm, I'm a little concerned about having to rip up the entire length of Eastman Road. Mm -hmm. and I have expressed that concern to, to the fire chief. Okay. 
Anybody have anything else? If not, we have a motion for the board to entertain. Um, I have a motion for the board to consider that I move that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented the application of Wiley Enterprises LLC for major subdivision review and a resource protection permit for East, Eastman Meadows, a 46 unit condominium with clubhouse and one single family lot located at Eastman Road be tabled to the regular December 18th, 2007 meeting at which time a public hearing will be held. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? And we don't need any vote or just to be on the November. No. Just sign them up. <laughs> what it, date will that mean? It's, a, it's zero, zero after four innings. Before everybody leaves, everybody else leaves, I don't know if it was one of you that said this or not, but there was a comment made about somebody was disturbed about the fact that Maureen said something about the fire chief. And oh, that gentleman left. Oh, he left. Well, let me just say it now, in case he's watching television at home, because he hasn't got anything else to do tonight. Yeah, I was going to um, two. The, you know, very often people operate and respond to situations about which they know very little. And that was an extraordinarily complex situation, which didn't appear so tonight, but it was. And we actually came up probably with a compromise that was workable. And so to say that somebody doesn't care who's in a responsible position about other people who are in responsible positions isn't true at all. And I just wanted to make that very clear. And if the gentleman who said it is listening, I hope he takes it to heart. So motion. My move to adjourn. Second. Thank you for your time tonight. This morning, what's the, I'm sorry, what was the date of the November? You, you said it nine in life. It's the election night. Sixth. Yeah. Yeah, November sixth. Um yeah. so vote first. Come vote first. <laughs> 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 you really I don't know. <laughs> it's great. I need to, it's